Chairman Kinski. Mr. Chairman, you do have a quorum for purposes of reimbursement. Representative Henderson. Representative Sherwood. Here. Representative Zwanitzer. Here. Senator Anderson. Here. Senator Nethercott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we want to cover everything. We want to see what everybody has to say, but we want to avoid duplicative testimony because we've got a number of people here that have five plus hour drives ahead of them at the end of the day. So we want to stay on time and, and finish on time. And uh, we are scheduled to end at, um, let's see, five, and, and we're hoping to stay on that schedule. Uh, first up, we have Game and Fish Department. Mr. Nesvik, welcome. Well. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, good morning to the members of the Joint Appropriations Committee. I'm Brian Nesvik, for the record, uh, Director of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. I have here with me today um, Deputy Director John Kennedy, our CFO of Meredith Wood, and then also the Chief of our Fiscal Division, Greg Phipps. Um, what I will do here this morning is, is summarize uh, the budget that was approved for FY23 by our Commission last July, um, including both uh, what we've got budgeted, what uh, we have for kind of an exception or a one-time budget that's approved for this year. And I'll talk a little bit about revenues and then uh, a little bit about some of our, our current successes and challenges regarding our fiscal situation. I'll start by also saying that um, overall, Game and Fish's fiscal situation is in a, in, we're in a very good spot right now. I think that um, we took very seriously the direction that we received from the legislature four or five years ago um, when general funds were um, removed from the department, um, when those last general funds were, were not allocated, what we heard was go run game and fish like a business. You have your own um, revenues. We were provided with a, a modest fee increase to help offset those costs from, the, from what we lost from the general fund. And we've taken that advice to heart and, um, and it's put us in a very good spot. And I'm going to talk some of the, the details of that. Um, this year, our approved budget is a $90.4 million budget in our standard budget. There's a, a PowerPoint that you were all provided. I'm not going to go through every, um, every bit of that PowerPoint. I'm glad to dive into any part of it that you'd like, but I thought I would summarize. Um, I just summarized certain parts of that PowerPoint. Um, as I said, we've got a $90.4 million budget for uh, this coming fiscal year. Um, you can see in the in the first page there the breakdown, but it's very similar to what we've seen in the past with most of um, our allocation to the wildlife division and wildlife management, um, second to, uh, seconded by fish and then our services division. That comprises most of the work that Game and Fish um, that Game and Fish does on an annual basis. Our revenues continue to exceed our expenditures, and again, I will talk um, what what the consequence of that has been. Um, we've continued to have a budget, though, both our exception budget and our standard budget that has been below our annual revenues for a number of years now. Our revenues continue um, very similar to in the past to be 65% from um, license revenue and then about 20% from um, three large federal grants. So Pittman Robertson, Dingle Johnson, Wallet Bro, most of that coming from Pittman Robertson, which Many of you know as an excise tax on sporting goods, firearms, ammunition. Um, those revenues have continued to remain strong. They're unpredictable, but they have been strong for a number of a number of years now. The remaining 15% of our revenues come from a lot of um, smaller grants, um, some interest on um, some of our investments, um, access, yes, donations, those kind of things. Um, we also have this is a little bit of a new way of looking at and organizing our expenditures. We, we align them a little bit more closely to the way that um, general fund agencies uh, craft their budgets and determine their one-time expenditures. And so we, we really have four pots of money. We have, it's all in one big account for the most part, but we have a, a, an allocation that's the approved budget by the commission. That's the $90.4 million. And then we have, um, a one-time list of approved projects that this year is $7 million. And those are projects that are just similar to how you look at one-time spending. Um, those are high priority projects that have been um, developed by the department and the commission. 
I'll summarize some of those here in a minute after I finish talking about all four pieces of our budget or of our account. The third piece of our account is, are those funds that are in there, but they've been allocated by the commission to a, a large project, they just haven't been spent yet. Um, but obviously we have to kind of pull those off to the side to make sure that we account for those and don't spend them. The fourth piece is our, um, it's basically our operating reserve. And so the commission um, decided uh, three or four years ago that um, it was wise and prudent, fiscally responsible management to um, take seven months. We started actually, I think, with five months. We're up to seven months now of operating expenditures and place them into a almost like a rainy day account, similar to the LISRA. And those funds, thanks to the wisdom of this committee and the support of this committee um, and a bill that was passed last year, we are now able to invest those in Pool A and um, realize a higher rate of return from those that are in our, our operating reserve. Essentially, the, the thought behind that was to ensure that with the unpredictability of a lot of our revenues, that if we ever had a, a you know an unexpected change in either federal funding or our license revenue, that we would be able to keep the lights on with no revenue for seven months. The commission um, has expressed interest and it's the long-term goal of being that, that account being up to a one-year um, allocation, so 12 months worth of operating um, expenditures in that reserve. The remaining, the fourth piece is those, all the funds that are just left. So I told you that our expenditures have been lower than our um, revenue. And so that discretionary pot of money that the commission has that's unobligated that they can use on high priority projects for one-time expenditures is 16 million, 16.5 million um, currently. Some of the approved projects, there's a pretty good list of them totaling 7.1 million, but some of the things I wanted to highlight here today that were some of the larger expenditures. This is, for those of you that are looking at the PowerPoint, it's the very last page. Um, we've certainly have concerns within the department and we have heard loud and clear from the public that there is um, growing concern about mule deer in Wyoming and a real interest in us investing more in, in mule deer habitat improvements and in mule deer management in general. So you can see there are three different line items um, for this coming one-time budget that are specific to mule deer. One is the mule deer initiative, which focuses on doing habitat improvement projects all over the state. Um, another is a research project that's um, being led by the University of Wyoming, the Hobbs School, um, that's been ongoing for several years now. I'm looking at long-term um, effects of mule deer management, different um, impacts on what, you know, what causes changes in mule deer numbers and populations. And, uh, and so that project, again, is in this year's budget, the Wyoming Range Mule Deer Project. And then thirdly, um, we've, we've looked hard at ways that we can use new technology and really um, establish a better baseline and some, you know, applicable new management techniques we could help to enhance mule deer. And, and this, this is a, a one-time project, but it's going to take a few years to, to um, execute. But that's a pretty significant investment by the commission of $2.3 million um, that will begin here in this coming year. We, we produce uh, millions of sport fish on an annual basis, and it takes quite a bit of those fish hatcheries are expensive to, to maintain them and to replace parts when they break. There's a pretty good um, investment here in our one-time budget between three different hatchery projects um, to update or renovate or even improve some of those, those systems. Um, there's also a kind of in line with that, a, a tank replacement. So really four hatchery projects on the list. We've, um, as you, many of you know, you were here when, when this, um, when this was first became a problem in Wyoming and the aquatic invasive species program was established, um, in our state. It was, it was based on legislation that was, um, uh, that was championed by, at the time, Senator Leland Christensen, the late great. And, um, that program continues to be of high importance to the department. We continue to realize that if we have an infestation of zebra quagga mussels in our state anywhere, um, that, that it's, a, it's a bad day for Wyoming. Other states that have these infestations um, over the long term have nothing but problems with everything related to water. Water infrastructure, um, obviously fisheries and populations of um, of of live of wild fish, 
um, hydroelectric power generation, municipal water supply, basically anything that touches water can be impacted by these things. And it costs millions of dollars on an annual basis to mitigate, um, to mitigate their effects. And there is no way to get rid of them. And so we've continued to really work hard at developing a strategy that's focused on prevention of allowing them in our state. We're still in a spot in Wyoming where we don't have them. And our, our approach is to really work hard on our borders at all of our ports to inspect every boat that comes into the state um, so that to ensure that they don't bring the, these muscles into the state. Um, we've also, as a side here, developed rapid response plans that um, direct our actions and estimate the costs if we did have a body of water that was infested with zebra or quagga mussels. And, um, and those plans are, uh, were implemented and approved by the commission here about three years ago. That's a summary of the larger expenditures on our, um, on our one time budget. I did miss invasive annual grasses. Um, that's another problem in Wyoming that we've, the commission has invested in. And, you know, from my perspective, looking across the entire state, this is one of those, um, this is one of those problems where I believe um, our state needs to continue to invest and increase our work towards um, eradicating invasive annual grasses, primarily cheatgrass, medusa head, and ventnata. Um, the commission's invested, the state um, has invested. I think you've got a, I know you've got a request this year for, for a small amount of money to deal with um, some additional invasives treatments. And um, we have been seeking federal funds to help us with that as well. It affects wildlife, it affects ranching, it affects um, the, the diversity of, of um, species, native species across our state. The, that kind of summarizes the, the current account that we have. I did want to highlight a few things here. Um, we have obviously, just like every other state agency, we've had inflationary impacts. We've been able to, we've, we had to dip into that discretionary funding in order to um, take a much larger leap of about six to 7%. Um, across all of our budgets to adjust for inflation from this year, this last year, um, but but we were able to do that, and we still have are are in a good fiscal position. Um, obviously, that some of those expenses that have really we've we've been impacted the most by by inflation are our personnel, which was much needed, not a complaint. We uh, we needed to provide um, pay increases for our people, and so that was greatly appreciated. Um, vehicles, obviously, were continue to struggle. We've got money budgeted to buy vehicles and we can't buy them. Um, dealerships can't, can't provide them. Out of a 48 vehicle request, um, we, we were able to secure six right now. And so um, that's been an inflationary slash supply chain challenge for us. Hay is always a challenge because it's unpredictable. And, and obviously the costs of hay were up this year. The costs of trucking hay was up. We've um, I think the governor mentioned yesterday when he talked to all of you about, uh, you know, some ranching practices of saving hay for the leaner years. And, and we have, um, we've done that in the past. We started what we call hay banking um, seven or eight years ago, where when hay was cheaper, we would buy it. We built some hay sheds. We, we store that hay in a bank, basically. And then when hay is more expensive, we buy less and deplete the bank. Well, we depleted the bank this past year and the year before. And so now, you know, we're having to, to pay the cost. We're kind of waiting for um, hay costs to come down so we can fill those banks back up again. But that's one of the inflationary costs that certainly affected us. Flights, we, we a lot of our wildlife surveys, a lot of our collaring work, a lot of our mule deer work um, requires flight time and that's become more expensive. And then obviously utilities, taxes. We, um, we are a state agency that pays property taxes on all of the commission owned lands that we have across the state, as well as our game warden stations, other real property that we own. And, and just in, in Teton County alone, you know, we've had significant increases in, in property taxes. The, um, a couple of those projects that I talked about where we have money set aside, where the commission's already approved them, um, but we haven't spent the money yet. The, the major line items in there are, um, a project to construct, um, build, employ housing in Jackson. Um, we, we're at a point where in, if we're going to maintain a presence in an office in Jackson, we don't really have any other option. We can't recruit 
Um, we can't get anybody to go there if we don't have a place for them to live. And so we have um, invested, we've set that money aside to be able to construct, um, I think we're at six houses, John, in the first phase, and, a, and then a more of a multi, multi-unit multi um, facility there on our own property that we own at the South Park uh, Wildlife Habitat Management Area. And, and that's the significant, that's the biggest part of what we've got set aside there. We've got money set aside for wildlife crossings where we've already committed money to some of the ongoing projects there. And then also some access um, acquisitions and easements. Um, as I mentioned, we've continued to have strong um, Pittman-Robertson type um, revenues from federal aid that's come to the department for, for a lot of years now. And um, I don't have a prediction as to where that goes, but it, it has been strong for, for a long time. The the last thing I wanted to talk about, I talked about investment pool A, that, that likely will generate an additional couple million dollars of revenue for us on an annual basis. Um, we um, continue, and I, I, um, I certainly wanna express my support for all of your consideration and work on employee um, salary increases again. Um, that it's, it's become an issue for our department, similar to what you're gonna hear from a lot of other agencies with recruitment and retention. And, um, you know, if it was up to Brian Nesvik, we'd figure out a way to have all of our employees at the midpoint, the MPP. Um, and, and that's, that's certainly our, our goal. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would be glad to answer questions or do a, a more thorough um, dive into any part of our expenditures. You all have a list of some of the major line items that we have in our budget. And I'd be glad to address those or have somebody here on my team address them. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna go through questions, Q and A about your presentation. Then we wanna talk a little bit about your budget process and our, and our role or, or not in that. Okay. Representative Stiff. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Director Nesvik, um, it sounds like revenues are healthy for the agency. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the Access Yes program uh, my constituents tend to be hunters, care a lot about access to public lands, want to be able to have easements to cross corners. If you know about how many easements have has the agency been able to uh, acquire for the benefit of the public over the past year or two? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Stith, um, excellent question. So I'll start by talking about just recently in the last, um, here over the last six months or so, some of the larger access um, agreements and acquisitions that we've been able to secure. Um, first of all, the Raymond, Mount, uh, Raymond Mountain access area over in Western Wyoming, um, an easement that we worked with Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation there and spent significant money on out of access yes money, was able to open up 30,000 acres of previously unaccessed or very difficult to access public lands. We also worked a long-term um, lease between three grazing associations and the private landowners over at Bear River Divide in, in southwestern Wyoming. Um, that's a couple hundred thousand acres of access. We secured that um, for 30 years. We also recently had a, a ranch owner, a uh, family come to us and, and say that they had to dispose of their ranch business kind of a decision and that they really wanted us to have it. And we were able to negotiate that and, and secure that ranch on the south end of the Bighorns, kind of in a checkerboard area that um, the, the deeded acres were at about 12, uh, 2,500 acres. And, uh, but it opened up access to additional public lands and it also connects to another wildlife habitat management we have in that area. In addition to that, our, our standard, kind of our long standing, um, legacy kind of programs of, of walking areas as well as hunter management areas continues to secure um, well over a million acres of access on an annual basis. Um, we're able to, because of good cooperative landowners, we're able to secure that access much cheaper than, you know, we can't compete with folks that are in, in the business of commercial hunting, but uh, a lot of landowners have just wanted to have um, the opportunity to have game and fish managed and then allow the public to have free access. And so those, um, those areas across the state, we have, like I said, over a million acres of uh, habitat management areas, or I'm sorry, of uh, walking areas and hunter management areas across the state. We have 
the legislature, um, Representative Western here a few years ago introduced a bill and it was passed that increased the cost of the conservation stamp and the increased the, the, um, the delta between the previous cost and the new cost and that additional revenue was earmarked specifically for accessing um, lands that are otherwise difficult to access public lands. And that has generated about $1.3 million a year for access. And so that money is what we've used for some of these projects I just talked about. And then we, were, we also maintain a, a balance in there too, so that we're ready for any new opportunities that come along. We've asked folks across the state, our, our team, to identify places where we could in the future secure more access. And we got a pretty good list of projects. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Director Nesvik, when you talked about hay banking and the cost of hay, what, what kind of percentage and uh, increase of, of price of hay per ton have you seen over the last couple of years? Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, I'm going to ask the CFO if she can give me some help with that. Okay. So, yeah, I, I can tell you, I can give you some ballpark estimates. So, I know that um, prior to this year, we were paying around um, 200 to $240 a ton delivered. And this year, it's in some cases north of 300. So, 20 all the way up to 50% increases in the cost of both the purchasing the hay and then delivering it. Yeah. So, you're, Mr. Chairman, so then freight and price of the commodity both have gone up substantially. And then, Mr. Chairman, a follow up I had just had a couple of questions and I, as you talk about, I look, I see your cheat grass, I see your predator management fund in there, then I see some WWNRT collaboration there. <clears throat> and just note that in the governor's uh, budget, he, he's requesting for some additional help for predator management. I know you work a lot with the WWNRT and collaboration, but I, I'm assuming like on predator management that there's some, there's additional collaboration that's available between the the agency and agencies on that. Can you is is that an accurate assumption, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson? That's accurate. And really, the way that the funding that you're um, describing now goes into the Animal Damage Management Board, Director Miyamoto and I co-chair that board, and we have our teams both contribute to both agriculturally focused predator management, but also predator management projects that benefit wildlife. The commission allocates 200,000 um, annually to that um, program. And so that's how we um, have addressed and have a role with predator management. And then one final question there, Mr. Chairman, and that goes to your, our, our vacancy list. And as I go through the vacancies, you guys, of course, are, employ a lot of people, but could you just help me understand what the, the TP, the temporary positions that will all be filled in in 23 are those just seasonal people that you use and then is and that goes to year end how does that how does that work please yeah mr chairman representative larson that that's correct most of those are seasonal uh, we a significant number of them are with our aquatic invasive species program the inspectors that we have out at the ports as well as um, we have fisheries technicians that we only employ during the field season we have wildlife technicians that are the same and so that number fluctuates and, and it's much higher in the summer than it is in the winter. But that is where we've, um, those types of positions are how we've used to address mainly short term kind of employment needs where we don't want to use up an FTE. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else? Representative Nicholas, co Chairman Thank Nicholas. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious your number, your total number of full time employees, how has that changed in the past? five or 10 years. So Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, so it has not changed. We have a cap. It's a, a governor's cap. It's 403 positions. I, I take that back. It has changed by three. So there were, it was 403. Governor Meade froze three of them. Um, we were asked to take on a new responsibility with some work with the university through the, by the governor's office. And so those three positions were added back into our cap or unfrozen. So we have 403 and it's been that um, to, since 2003. Now, we obviously, we fluctuate below that 
um, depending on, you know, what's going on. We have, we always have some vacancies. Um, right now, I believe we've got a total of um, 22 vacancies, but almost all of those are in the recruiting process or being reclassed. Well, I'm curious about your ability to recruit and retain in terms of the wages you're paying. Um, mm -hmm. So where are you seeing the difficulties in filling and, and you know, is it the warden side, the administrative side, how does that work? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, the probably the two areas where we have the most difficulty and definitely the, the, the highest priority for us right now is game wardens. We, um, 10 years ago, had way more applicants, qualified applicants than we could hire. And today, um, we can't find enough people that will apply to be a game warden. We're 12, I believe 12 positions short right now. And we only have across the state 60 or 70 game wardens. So that's a significant number. Um, we oftentimes have difficulties recruiting folks in IT. We do have a few IT folks that are game and fish IT folks that deal with our licensing system. Um, and generally, you know, across the board, we've had a higher rate of turnover, not, not the, I, I should leave the wildlife biologist out of it because that's a place where we haven't seen a lot of turnover, but in virtually every other part of the agency, we've had more turnover recently than we we've seen in the past. And, you know, a lot of those folks we do exit surveys have indicated that it does have a lot to do with um, salary. You know, the, the one thing that I think is definitely in the state of Wyoming's favor on this issue is that we, you know, a lot of these folks are younger, younger people, and they don't see how big of a benefit, you know, that health insurance and retirement and those kind of things are. And so it's more with younger folks that we see the turnover than it is with the more tenured people in the agency. Um, I will tell you that um, we, I, I feel very strongly that we need to have another salary increase um, if we're going to continue to retain good people and be able to recruit. And salary isn't going to fix all of our recruiting problems either. We've had to, for the game wardens, we've had to create a whole kind of refocus a couple of our people just to be recruiters and retainers and trainers to try to get, solve this in a new way. And so do you follow the, <clears throat> the regular process of other agencies in terms of what your um, pay scale is and go through a, a and I for positioning, um, you know, identification and placement? Mr. Co-Chairman, absolutely. That's we, we so, follow all the state rules. So your pay raises are basically structured and follow the increases that we give everybody else? Identically. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm just curious if you, you know, it's, it's, for example, in Lander, almost the entire town now has a deer population in it, and they never leave town. Mm -hmm. And now the, the, the outdoor residents at the small ranchettes are elk on all, all, all sides of mm -hmm. town. I mean, is that ha happening in other communities? It's just interesting how that's uh, it, it, the kind of landscape is changing. It is, and Mr. Co-Chairman, I would tell you that, you know, the resident deer um, in local municipalities is probably not a real new problem. That We've had that for quite some time. Um, but elk, elk continue to do very, very well in the state of Wyoming, and they are showing up in places where we've never seen them before. And, you know, we've, we have concerns that there's competition issues between elk and mule deer, and that maybe some of our mule deer problems are created by elk. We also have agricultural, um, you know, cattle and sheep ranchers concerned about increasing numbers of elk. We've had to take some actions recently to, to deal with that and to try to um, increase harvest on elk. But um, what you're observing is, is definitely accurate and it's not just in Lander, it's been across the state. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think in in that vicinity now, there's probably four or five ranches that are running buffalo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the one that, where they're putting up a five foot five fence of, of basically steel pipe that goes around their ranch. And, and I've noticed and I have complaints about some of the, particularly the younger elk um, calves can't get through the fence. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's migratory issues with that. And I'm just wondering how much you are, guys are paying attention to it. If you see and how you address those issues as they develop, you know, we just happen to be, I know the landowners who are adjacent to it. And as part of the, 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 the uh, fencing agreement is that if there are problems that they will fix it mm -hmm. um, as part of the, you know, mitigate whatever is out there, but, but it's, it's definitely happening. And I'm just wondering if you guys are, are paying close attention to it. 
Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Co-Chairman. We, um, we have seen similar issues in other places, but I will tell you that for the most part, um, we're seeing almost an opposite effect where there's more, part of it's because there's more funding available from the federal government through NRCS, but there's more of an, a lot of private landowners have had an interest in transitioning to wildlife friendly fence. And I mean, on an annual basis, there are thousands of miles of fence that are created or that are um, updated or replaced with wildlife friendly fence. And so we, we're kind of seeing a move, I guess, the other direction, but there's, there are those um, definite extremes and holding Buffalo and in, inside of a fence is difficult. So I, I can certainly see where they would be putting up some pretty, some fence that's pretty impenetrable. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Guru. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Brian. Yeah, I know this is always a hard angle. Mm -hmm. um, first, I want to say thank you to the board. Um, or commission, um, you know, Representative Schwartz and I uh, chased the commission around um, Pinedale and up in the basin a couple of times and met with them talking about housing issues. And just wanted to let you know, I know it's difficult. It's been difficult. The, the commission was circumspect. I wish I had about the cost um, in the beginning, but they seem to have come around. And thanks to Mr. Kennedy and thanks to you and the rest of the team, been able to do it, pull it off inside the regulations that the county's laid down. And, and it's, I think it's been a positive. Um, I also think it was imperative given the fact that in Jackson, the number of people you touch there in the office, people coming in where they're asking for licenses, you're asking for information that has nothing to do with what Cave and Fish does. The amount of people that you interact with there has got to be as high there in Cody and the wonderful facility you have there. It's just been great. I was, my question was, I was looking at your budget and I don't know, I'm doing lander math a little bit, just kind of wagging it, but it appears that between your savings, the money you set aside for operations, your project money, and then your total take and license fees, that matches reasonably close. Like it's a little bit of it's apples and oranges, but uh, reasonably close to what, to what we do at the state level. Is that how you see that? Yeah, I think it's, Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Drew, I, I think it is reasonably close, I would say. Um, we have, we, we know that we've got some things on our long-term high priority list that are gonna cost money. One of them is, I'll just mention is, is a, a warm, cool water hatchery. Right now we import um, all of our warm and cool water species, which brings with it risk to bring with it or zebra mussels or other AIS. So we're looking at ways to mitigate that. Well, we, we have a way to mitigate it by raising our own, but it's a significant cost. So one of the things that we're continually trying to do is make sure that, that the amount of um, revenue that, that continues to be saved, still there's still a difference between that and what we spend both between the budget and the one time. And we're going to continue to do that because we know we've got those larger projects coming up and we, you know, we don't want to go back to the days when we came here and, and ask for CapCon money every year to do fish hatcheries and office buildings. So. Steinmetz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Director, for your help with the black bears this summer. It's not just the elk that are <laughs> moving into town, but we had a black bear in almost every small town there for a while in mm -hmm. Goshen County. So my question is more general in nature. Um, last year, we worked on the outdoor recreation issues that we are seeing in other states with pressure to wildlife as that, that new industry moves in. And we have more money in the budget this year for outdoor recreation. So I just wanted an overview on how you're working back and forth with Director Westby, how that's progressing and um, kind of what your plans are to make sure that wildlife isn't impacted by that that. Um, new influx in our state. Mr. Chairman, Senator Steinmetz. So first I'll say that um, Director Westby and, and actually Director Schober and I have this discussion. We, we meet at least quarterly, sometimes more often to talk about um, exactly what you just brought up. And so one of the primary strategies that Director Westby and I have discussed is trying to locate and, and trying to use, create more opportunity, user opportunity at places that are already disturbed. So those places where we already have a state park, there's not a lot of wildlife habitat. It's already got an influx of a lot of people. You know, my request to him has been, 
figure out a way to develop that more so that we um, are citing new opportunity in a place where we have already got a disturbance. So the other thing too, that um, I think he and I specifically have talked about is taking places like Gray Rocks Reservoir and transitioning it into a state park. Right now it's owned um, by the power company and you know, they, we've been working with them to try to, we manage it, but we've been, it's, it's not managed as well as a state park would be managed. They, they're in that business. They do it well, and we're not. And so uh, that's another opportunity where we've tried to figure out how to do that. Probably a place where there's more, where I have more concern is on our national forests, where it's, a, it's, we don't have as much of a role in determining how they're going to manage recreation and use. You know, I went over the Bighorn Mountains this summer, and I have never seen so many people on top of the Bighorn Mountains in the middle of the summer. And we, we hear the same things and see it at, in the snowy range. Places that are really accessible are being impacted. And, and so, you know, we, we've had these discussions. We meet regularly with the Forest Service to talk about, um, you know, what their plans are and how they might be able to help. And, and I'll just tell you to this point, I, you know, I, we haven't made any progress. Um, but that doesn't mean that we haven't, that we've lost any focus on it. Cause I do, we saw a little bit of a downturn this year, probably economic driven, but um, I don't think it's, I think the long-term trend is going to be up and we're going to need to deal with that as a state. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else for director Neswick and his team? Anyone? Uh, director, I want to thank you for the, uh, you mentioned cooperation, collaboration. Uh, I certainly see it in my district. I, I just went to the uh, Predator Damage Management Board meeting and there were some game and fish folks there and mm -hmm. they don't always agree, but they've got the lines of communication going and, and there's been some positives that come out of that. Mm -hmm. I also appreciate the, your work on the invasive grasses. Um, my friend David Kane, a rancher, he said, if you ever get Medusa head or Ventanata, you'd wish you had your cheat grass back. Yeah. And uh, the cooperation with the weed and pest districts is is phenomenal, and that's greatly appreciated. So with that, I've got a, a, a why question for you that came up. We had three trainings for uh, JAC members incoming and just people interested in the budgeting process. In the course of that, the discussion about game and fish came up, and and uh, the discussion was we get from Game and Fish a, a PowerPoint with sort of a top level budget, but we don't get anything that is um, as detailed as you've seen what we we deal with, mm -hmm. whether it's there's the department, the division, clear down to the unit level. Um, and uh, and so the question was, why why don't we or or can we get that kind of of a budget document. And it's not that uh, we necessarily want to exercise direct authority over your budget. Your commission does that, but we feel obligation to at least understand it better than we do. And so can you tell us uh, why is it that we don't get a, a greater detail and could we? Yeah, cer certainly, Mr. Chairman, the answer to your question is, is absolutely. You can have as much detail, as many pages as you'd like. Well, you know, we're willing to share all of it. The reason in the past um, I think we've done it this way now for, well, we've done it as long as I've been the director, and I don't know how long before that, um, that based on a request from the committee, they said, you know, we're, our statutory charge is to review, provide review of your budget, so we just want an overview. Um, but if you want more detail, we're glad to provide the whole thing to the entire committee. Uh, please, Kevin Hibbert. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll be very brief. Representative uh, Sue Wallace uh, proposed years ago a, a process to where the Game and Fish Commission and the WIDOC Commission would present their budgets to the Joint Appropriations Committee. And that was co-sponsored by then President Nicholas. And there's a statute that requires the Game and Fish Commission to come to this body and give a presentation. The boundaries of what's required in that presentation can be decided between the commissions and the, and the Joint Appropriations Committee, what you'd like to see. Thank you. So, Director, uh, Senator Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, because there's, there's a couple people in Jeffrey City watching today, mm -hmm. as a courtesy, will you keep me informed of any of those issues coming up in the Jeffrey City area? Mr. Chairman, Senator Salazar, absolutely. So to, to just put a, a, 
I don't know what this committee is going to want to do in terms of the level of detail with white otter, game and fish, but uh, certainly we'll make a determination and get back to you early enough that you can bring us enough detail that it, it kind of fits in with the, the, the same methodology that we use for all other budgets. Uh, or we may determine that, you know, the PowerPoint is enough. And I appreciate your offer for as much detail or as little. Certainly, I, uh, in my district, I get a lot of questions about game and fish. And I'm really, so I call Larry Hicks. <laughs> and then he helps me out there. But I could call my local game game and fish folks as well. But it's it's a lot of those things I don't understand and I should understand better. But I think we've got a committee now that has an insatiable appetite for detail. So I I think we we may be looking for a bit more information than we've had in the past. Well, and just so you know, Senator, so sometimes when I need to know something about game and fish, I call Senator Hicks as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Anything else from any members of the committee? Mr. Chairman. It's Kevin Hibbard. Just Real quick, the current statute says as prescribed by the state budget department. So whatever you'd like to instruct us to do for that outcome, we'll, we'll uh, facilitate that with the, the commissions. Thank you. We'll have that as a committee. Uh, we'll have that discussion with staff, and then we'll get back to you and, and let you know what the what is the pleasure of the group. Thank you so much. Mr. Thank Mr. you. Chair. Please, Mr. Co-Chairman. I would say that on occasion um, during the interim, we've had Game and the Fish come in and do a, a presentation when we have a little more time. Um, to actually kind of walk through their various agencies and divisions. It's just it's just more convenient for us and them as opposed to our general annual um, budgetary market. So it might be in the off season. Yeah, and I think Game and Fish understands the season and the off season. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Live by it. Representative Larson. Yep. Director Nisbik, I know <clears throat> you've had a very busy year. Um, working for the benefit of wildlife and for the, the, the sportsmen in, in the state. And part of that is, is with the Fish and Wildlife Service Start Department of Interior on issues with, with wild and domestic sheep leases, with, of course, with our friends, grizzly bear and, and wolves and stuff. I, it would be helpful, I think, to, to this committee as we, um, as we, as we, contemplate this whole role of that the committee has to just maybe periodically just get something from you on on how those efforts are going I'm not trying to cause extra work for you but you know sometimes we're just not in we know it's not intentional but we're just out of the loop by virtue but then we we're, we come in and have requests to help maybe do some support funding and some of that stuff and we're just having to re-educate ourselves on that so maybe it's some of that stuff that you provide to your standing committee or something on those efforts maybe could be shared with you i think that we'd be interested in, at least i would yeah mr chairman representative larson we're we're glad to provide that and we realize that no game and fish budget presentation to jc is complete without the word grizzly bear being uttered at least once hmm. anything else from any members of the committee any closing comments, Director? No, Mr. Chairman, I just appreciate um, I appreciate the opportunity to do this. We're proud of our budget and what, what we do each and every day for the state of Wyoming, and we're always glad to come talk about it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Merry Christmas. And you as well.
call us back to order and uh, next the Community College Commission. Welcome, Mrs. Caldwell. Floor is yours. Oh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, members of the committee, um, uh, thank you for having us here today. Um, I am Sandy Caldwell, Executive Director of the Community College uh, Commission. I have with me, I do have several introductions to make as we go through. I have the Deputy Director, uh, Dr. Ben Moritz, uh, here with me at the table. And I also have our CFO, uh, Mr. Michael Swank. You might have met him before. <laughs> we are happy to have him sitting on this side of the table. Uh, so you'll hear from him in a little bit. If we need her, our Chief Technology Officer at Paris Edburn is in the audience, um, and as well as some other staff who are watching probably on YouTube or in the audience. Uh, I do also want to mention we have multiple people joining us from YouTube uh, or for, on uh, Zoom this morning. Uh, we should have Chairman uh, Dr. Fries. They may be a little late, though. I'm thinking they might have tried to be uh, joining shortly. And then we also have, uh, so Chairman uh, Dr. Jackie Fries is on, should be on Zoom shortly. And then we have Vice Chair of the Commission, Megan Getz, who I do see up there. And then I do want to introduce our college presidents. Um, we are a, a, a big, complicated family. And so I want to introduce those in the audience with us today. We have Dr. Darren Devine. He's the president of the presidents. He's the liaison with me to the executive council comprised of all the uh, presidents and Ms. Taylor. We have Dr. Joe Schaefer. He's the president of LCCC. Um, and then we have other presidents who are going to be joining us. I think we're a little bit ahead. They will be jumping on shortly. Um, we, who are going to be on Zoom, we have Dr. Brad Tendall, uh, president of Central Wyoming College. We have Dr. Jeffrey Hawes, president of EWC. We will have Dr. Janelle Oberlander. She's the president of Gillette College. Um, we'll have President Lisa Watson. She's the president of Northwest College. We'll have Dr. Tribley. He is the president of Sheridan College. And not joining us today, but I do want to recognize her, is Dr. Kim Dale. She's the president of Western Wyoming Community College. Um, and I do want to recognize, uh, this is our first time, Dr. Jeffrey Hawes is our newest president in the community college system. He started at EWC on July 1. And I will tell you, uh, Dr. Hawes has just hit the ground running. He's definitely had his hand, hands full and he's just a pleasure to work with. Also on Zoom, um, we will have Mr. Terry Dugas. He is the executive director of Wyoming Public TV and that fits within the commission. Uh, and in addition to those that are on Zoom, um, I will mention the rest of the commissioners are very likely watching on YouTube right now, along with many of the 56 elected trustees um, that work with the, their executive director, Ms. Erin Taylor, who I think is also um, here. Uh, as we begin to go over our agency supplemental budget, we do have a short amount of time. And we did volunteer um, earlier. We had a much lengthy scheduled time and we did volunteer that up in the interest of brevity and knowing that we had a short supplemental uh, request for you. So we are going to make a uh, great time today. Uh, there are a few things that we do want to recognize today to use um, our time. Primarily, we do have uh, quite a few thank yous that we want to provide today. You don't always get to hear that. Um, I know you have many people come to you asking for things, complaining about things, but every once in a while, we need to take the time to give you some really sincere uh, thank yous. We also want to provide a few status updates as well. And then we, when we wrap up the single one uh, small uh, sub supplemental exception request and highlights, I do want to provide the opportunity to let the college presidents address things. Uh, president Devine, being the president of the presidents, is ready to speak on behalf of the college presidents, and we'll keep that brief. And then I also want to turn it over to Wyoming Public TV Executive Director, uh, Mr. Terry Dugall. He will also be very brief, so I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Um, there are only two documents for you, aside from our budget supplemental budget request and the 600 and 900 series. We have the at a glance document which you have been seeing for several years now. I got strong encouragement from Joint Appropriations many years ago to uh, put a quick hot sheet together. And, and we've been doing that ever since. So it contains a lot of data that um, you had requested that we uh, highlight. And then you have the Wyoming Public TV annual report that Mr. Dugas is required to submit. Um, 
As we get into this, I just want to hit a couple of highlights. I'm not going to go through that stuff that, uh, at a glance document, but I do want to take a moment to hit a few things that we'll reference in that particular document. Um, the SLEDS, the Statewide Longitudinal Education Data System that the Joint Appropriations gave us the latitude to work on. Um, I am very pleased to say, and I think you know, we did receive a multi-year grant on that. We'll be looking for an extension on that. It is operational. And we are very excited about that. We're gonna to begin to really crank out some data. And I'm also very pleased to share with all of you that we have also recently added Depart uh, Department of Family Services. Director Corin Schmidt has joined that executive board along with um, the superintendent of public instruction, the university president, Department of Workforce Services, uh, Director Cooley is on that board as long with, as well as myself and Dr. Okay, Faber which, which, serves again, on that. which board was that? Which board is that, Sandy? That is the SLEDS eBoard. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. All right, thank you. So it's actually working, and we want to thank you all for that support. Another thing I just wanted to give you a quick update on is the common, uh, it's often, it was in legislation, it was called the uh, common transcript or transfer process. It's called YO transfer, and it's, it's functional. It's operational. And in fact, the next steps on that are going to be the reverse transfer and then uh, likely next on that's going to be the prior learning assessment. A lot of work going on in that. And I wanted to let you know that there are actual outcomes to. Yep, you are. <laughs> Would you like this one, sir? We'll give you that one. Okay, so um, then we'll just we'll just keep going. I just again want to mention the Wyoming Community College System is one of the top community college systems in the country. Of course, we're a creation of the legislature, and another one of those. Good job because we are consistently ranked um, one on in one and two in the in the entire country, and that's due to the work uh, of you and of those incredible colleges that we are fortunate to have in our state. Um, I do want to uh, let you all know that we were set to have a much larger budget request that we really did not want to bring at this time. And I want to give some recognition to some folks that really helped us not have to go through that right now. Um, and it, it actually really helped us on our side and the college side. Um, so I want to thank Director Rennie McKay from the governor's office and um, Director Tricia Bach and a and for working with us to have a much smaller request by granting us a contract extension on our current student information system or the administrative computing system at the colleges. Um, we were up on that contract. They are allowing us to proceed. And that's really helpful because I think you've all heard there is a new community college system in, or uh, district in our state, Gillette College. And we really need to not have any sort of change while they're um, getting established as their own college. And then we also had a very devastating cyber attack a couple of years ago at Eastern Wyoming College. And Dr. Haas is really working on an IT infrastructure redo there. So any kind of mid change would be very difficult for our college system. So this was very, very helpful for us. And we wanted to give some recognition. And it also let us not bring a large budget request uh, potential to you. Um, in our next uh, biennial request, we will have a maintenance request. We will not come forward with any type of large request, at least until 2025 for that next biennium. Before so this leave, really helped us a lot. Before you leave that, just are you working with ETS on your maintenance request? And oh, on absolutely. New software program? Mr. Chairman, yes. And they were actually a part of that, that process. Uh, we are going to be releasing in collaboration with ETS um, and RFI. Okay. Now the college system and the UW system are outside of the state systems because they are housed at the institutions, but we do absolutely use them on the, on the consultation basis. And we actually met with Director, Vi Director Vida with the uh, CIOs and discussion. Thank you for that RFI. because regardless yeah. of housed inside, outside, mm -hmm. we're always going to send yep. you to ETS to make sure that you know, select the vendor first and then justify it afterwards. Yep. So we, we have the colleges working on the RFI and actually they worked with the RFI. So we're about to release that to work on a sort of a, what the menu of options would be when we come back in twenty. Thanks so much. Yep. Uh, and then Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chair, members of the committee, uh, we also want to thank the governor for the compensation recommendation, including the colleges in Wyoming Public TV 
public TV is inside that college uh, recommendation. And we hope that the joint appropriations and the legislature will look favorably on that. It is a priority for the commission and we are, are very pleased that we're included in that, in that request. I will say that we were a late add, uh, add on to the fixed cost inflation adjustment and we hope that we can be added to that request to the governor, particularly since this uh, was a biennial budget request for us for our fixed cost adjustment. Um, I wanna give some recognition again to you, Director Hibbard, uh, because he helped us uh, work through our late ed, uh, potential addition and how to write that in the letter. So thank you, Director Hibbard for that. And then um, I do also wanna recognize that the governor's support of the CAPCON and major maintenance request, as well as his recommendation for funding the Wyoming's Tomorrow Scholarship. And we'll, we'll, I'll have more about that in just a moment. So let's turn to that supplemental request, the one that we have. Um, and this is a this is actually a Capcon uh, computer application, and it, it is so that we can bring forward the Capcon recommendations. Uh, our system is antiquated. Uh, we did actually work with ETS uh, on this particular one, and you'll see a deputy director back in there. This is a next step in our the commission's transparency process. I will mention also this committee I'm referencing this committee a lot. Um, we've come a long way in our CAPCON process. And I will never forget the moment that um, uh, former Senate President uh, and Joint Appropriations uh, Chairman, Senator Eli Bebout, uh, sat me down and told me to clean that up, which we did. <laughs> and, and this is a continuing part of that process. You will find uh, our request first on page three of our supplemental, and then you will find more detail on page 13 and then finally, the explanations are pay on page uh, 15 and 16. And with that, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chair, I'd like to turn it over to our um, CFO, uh, Mr. Michael Swank, to Welcome, go into Michael. detail. Welcome, Michael. Pleasure as always to work with you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're in a good spot. Thank you, Mr. But Chairman. But you really do miss us. There are things, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, I will say that you, you can't really take, you know, 19 years of LSO out of me completely. So, <laughs> but I, I appreciate the opportunity to come to you today as the Chief Financial Officer for the Wyoming Community College Commission. It has been a, a wonderful, was I think nine months now, <laughs> and I appreciate all the staff at the commission, all the presidents and the, and the staff I work with at the colleges. They're all except, exceptional people and uh, they are. They help coordinate a lot of things for all of us here at the commission to make sure that we're steering this um, system in the right direction. If you, as Dr. Caldwell mentioned, our, the detail of our budget request, um, supplemental budget request is actually on page 15. It is the only request we have submitted for this um, supplemental budget. It is what we call our capital construction prioritization model. So during our capital construction process, we work with the colleges to um, assemble their information related to what are anticipated capital construction projects throughout the next year. We start this in the spring of each year, and part of that process is utilizing this model, which was developed about 10 or 12 years ago, and they put in their, their facility square footage and various um, components of their facilities into this, this software. And we have the, uh, the, it was developed 10 or 12 years ago with a consultant, and they um, helped put this all together into a calculation using uh, different types of metrics, um, how it uh, adheres to the statewide strategic plan and so forth. And then that provides the results of which projects best meet, or I wouldn't say best meet, but meet different elements of those prioritization um, metrics. And then provides our priorities that we submit to the Community College Commission each June. And then the commission um, uh, votes and decide, uh, uh, <laughs> they vote to um, approve which projects and in which order those, those projects move forward. This year, we experienced a rather interesting um, uh, potential, I guess, a problem during the model um, use, um, during the, the time we had to use the model. And this was in basically April and May. The actual model is actually eight different access databases, one at each facility or each college, and then a central database at the college commission. And what happens is they enter their material into their model. We copy it over to ours to a central location and then try to run that. 
will that transfer and coordination process between the college's systems and our system um, was much more difficult this year. We actually um, had one of our, or my, my predecessor in this position who has much more familiarity with it come in to actually um, troubleshoot on two, two different occasions. In the end, we finally got it to work. We did have to hand enter some information on our side um, that the colleges usually enter on their side so we could get it to work completely. So this particular request comes in that frame of mind, trying to continually do that manual process over and over again over the next few years is going to be much more time consuming and much more difficult, not on, only on our end, but also on the colleges. We've had to ask them probably three or four different times to resubmit material because the system was not logging it correctly between, the system, between each database. So beginning in uh, um, March and April, we asked ETS to consult with us on how best to get this software updated. Um, potentially to use a website-based uh, in, input portal. And uh, they provided that information, provided the estimate for the, what the potential cost would be in terms of the, the, the actual software, as well as training and getting all the colleges and the commission staff up to speed on this new, new approach. We submitted that to the commission. They approved that request in, um, at the end of August. At that time, the request was roughly $142,000. However, in the intervening couple months between that particular vote of the commission and in working continually with the, the ETS department, they came back at the beginning of October and let us know that they were going to, actually, I should back up. Their estimate was based on ETS's personnel doing the programming and doing the transition. We were notified in early October that that particular approach may not be the most suitable for us or the ETS, and they came back and provided a, suppl uh, a, a supplement um, cost analysis, which is the request you have in front of you of $369,000. This is to actually put this out for RFP and to um, obtain a vendor to do this work. And this would also include the same training and uh, uh, staff development funds to move this model forward. Um, if, I'm not sure if that provides all the explanation that you need, but I'm open for questions. Questions about the supplemental request. Representative Walters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A, a couple of questions. Uh, have you worked with state construction at all in discussing this new system? And will this system track what your major maintenance and routine maintenance is? Because I think the major maintenance and routine maintenance on these buildings or lack thereof also leads to the need for new facilities. And so a little discussion on that would be my starting question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Walters, this particular um, software system does not actually interface with the State Construction Department. However, we provide them the information out of this system when we um, provide them the information on square footage for all the facilities that are within the major maintenance model. So the colleges put all the information in the system and we provide that data to the, the, the State Construction Department. Um, in terms of how this particular um, request would update the software, that would have actually no impact on the state construction department specifically. If that, if that helps. Follow up, if I may. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think it'd be wise to visit with state construction before you did any purchasing in that regard, because I think they could offer some, some product solutions that might benefit not only your system, but benefit the state from a future cost perspective of, of what we're doing. Ms. Caldwell. Mr. Chairman and Representative Walters, um, we have we have worked very closely with the State Construction Department. We will actually ask them that because that's a really great point. Um, I've got some other points I'm going to make in just a moment about working with a State Construction Department. Um, we were we were a little bit delayed, so they know that this is occurring. So it isn't it isn't something that's a surprise to them because we were a little bit delayed trying to get everything to them by our statutory deadline to them because we were having uh, problems getting this done. So they're aware of this, um, but asking them if they know of a tool is actually a fabulous idea and we will do that. Got somebody in the back of the room raising their hand. Are you with state construction? ETS. ETS. Okay. You, you need to talk into the mic. Timothy Sheehan, Deputy Director for ETS. Sorry, Timothy, I didn't place you right away. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, 
ETS actually did reach out to Director Vincent and um, consult with him through our review process. Uh, they are uh, also indicated initial support of the process that we're going through. Um, these types of applications are a little bit specific to the use case. Um, so they are actually pulling some additional information for us in the process. Please, so, yes. Oh, Turn, pull the mic closer. Thank I apologize. Uh, I'll, I'll restart. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we did consult with Director Vincent at State Construction uh, through this review process. Uh, he and his staff did provide some some guidance on the software and, and indicated it's it's not uncommon to have um, some specific use case or some specific software for this. Uh, so we we are very much in collaboration with state construction on this. Thank you, Representative Larson. Were you done, Tom? For now. Okay. Well, <clears throat> in follow up to Tom and then a question, but I, you know, our what we're trying to do is avoid having two separate systems that won't talk to each other and and think that it would be beneficial on that. But my question is, as I'm trying to understand, Michael, is so we've not selected a vendor. This is a process. You've, you've got the appropriations to go out for an RFP and, and select a vendor because there evidently is multiple options or vendors that can provide this service. Am I getting that accurate? Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, you are correct. Thank you. Senator Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Wyoming's tomorrow. Um, I wanted to talk about that. So the Joint Education hang on, Committee. Could, hang on a second. Let's can we finish up the supplemental oh, and then let's jump sure. over to more generic questions if we could. Anything else on the supplemental? Anything else on the supplemental? I have a question. I want to be careful because co-trustee Getz is on the Zoom. And when I took the bar exam at 63, she was one of the bar examiners. <laughs> And she intimidated me then, and she intimidates me now, so I want to be careful. I need to understand these databases and why it takes this much money. To me, Sheridan's got three or four projects. Laramie's got three or four projects. They know what the cost is. I assume you get together, you shuffle those lists. Your prioritization system seems to be easy. It's your turn. That's the prioritization system, as near as I can tell. What do you need a database? You do, why don't everybody just come to the table with their list of projects and, and a, a rough dollar amount? Mr. Chairman, um, I can, uh, I can do some additional follow-up with you, but um, when the Cap, uh, Capcom process was established, we were to develop specific metrics in order to rank these projects so that they were done objectively. So we have a very robust process that uses 13 uh, different metrics in order to bring forward those projects so that there is an objective comparison across them. They have to align with the statewide college system strategic plan. They have to be in their master plan. There's just a, a, ver a, a variety of things that are, are required in that. So not only is it inserting, um, inserting the information, it also provides a rank, including how much uh, assignable square footage they have that is used for academic space. So it's I can give you that. I will. I, I'm happy to provide a more detailed summary and follow up uh, report for you on that particular inf piece of information. I don't need it. I'm just curious why putting some access databases together costs three hundred sixty nine thousand. So it's it's more than just the list of the projects. Representative Larson. So, Dr. Caldwell, if I <clears throat> if I get it accurately, when <clears throat> the colleges come together, they have existing assets, and then they may have requests for new assets. Uh, to be, to be built, and so all of that lumps in under a definition that we consider a capital construction. But when you when you when you start looking at that, then you get into capital renewal or renovation, which might be existing assets that then have to meet the criteria that this database helps you sort through based on your square footage, and then what's eligible to see if it qualifies. Capital renewal be, maybe being infrastructure projects that that is is outside new construction which is under the definition of capital construction so it helps you stay within the guidelines of the definitions that constitute capital construction that we then fund under capcon am i getting that accurate mr chairman representative larson you are um the only thing i would i would say is that capital renewal does not go into that model um, but beforehand, before anything is deemed as a capital renewal, we work very closely with state construction department. So it's 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 not that we just get the report and give them the information. We actually do advance work with them to make sure 
Renovations, um, once they exceed that 1.5, do indeed, if they're a making a request, do go through that model. And we actually have some of those projects um, that were forwarded out of, out of the commission on through the state uh, building commission that you have in your, uh, I, I'm assuming in your draft Capcom bill. But follow Mr. Chairman. You are correct. Uh, agreed, but that's that's why you have this yes, database sir. so it can sort through the parameters and the square footage and, and, and qualifying criteria to help you then determine what that priority list is. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson, yes. Anything else in the supplemental before I go to Senator Salazar? Senator Salazar, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my question on the um, Wyoming's tomorrow, I know that the, I know that the um, JEC uh, passed uh, funding for this. Um, assuming it's successful, when do you believe you'll be actually able to stand that up and go forward with that? Mr. Chairman, um, Senator uh, Salazar, uh, that was on my list of things that I was going to highlight mm -hmm. and, and do some recognitions of the Joint Education uh, Committee and the work that they have done. Um, so I will start off with answering that by the fact that the commission took this very seriously. Wyoming's Tomorrow is a priority uh, for the community college commissions and those published priorities. Um, when that legislation passed, the commission worked to, went to work very quickly. In their October meeting, they adopted the draft rules uh, for Wyoming's Tomorrow. We put together quite a robust uh, work group that included um, commissioners, included the university, the colleges, it also included representatives from business and industry as outlined in this in that uh, piece of legislation. So those draft rules are um, are in place. We are expecting to adopt them. We, the commission, which I have commissioned the chair and vice chair on here are ready to uh, adopt those in February, depending on the feedback. We may be altering those depending on how the legislation goes forward. So to more directly answer your question, if it is funded and there are eligible funds for distribution, we will be able to deliver those scholarships and grants to those adult learners in fall 2023. Follow up, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And then help me uh, remember, was there an amount that we were seeking in-kind funding from the private sector to finish the, the cap on the, on the funding of the fund? Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Salazar, um, in the governor's um, recommendation, he does have a match in that. In the joint education bill as it stands right now, it does not. I would uh, suggest that you, if you have, uh, which I know joint appropriations members don't have time, but if you did and you could watch that November the 15th um, discussion on Wyoming's Tomorrow, the joint uh, education committee had a very robust conversation about that, and in particular, the match. Now, one of the challenges with um, with seeking funds externally is they're not eligible to, as best we understand, for a charitable contribution. And that is a significant barrier in being able to do that. Um, another part of that, and I, I won't speak on behalf of the joint education, I don't have any capacity to do that, but part of their discussion is that the source of the revenue that the state receives is primarily on the backs of business and industry, um, but I would defer to, to any of those members to speak on that more directly. It is not in that draft legislation now. They heavily discuss that topic. Okay, we've got 15 minutes. Another follow-up? Representative Salazar? Repre uh, I saw Representative Stith and then Representative Walters. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if Representative Walters wants to talk about Wyoming's tomorrow, then that's more germane than my question, so okay. I, I would defer to him. Representative Walters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure if you were listening to the governor's remarks yesterday morning, uh, but there was a discussion in it from him and then further follow up from this committee about how to combine Wyoming's tomorrow, Wyoming works, as well as the Wyoming uh, nursing initiative. And so while I don't expect an answer today or a full answer today. I think some follow up from you and, and the community college commission on how to meld those together would be good. And, and a, an initial discussion right now would be uh, helpful. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, please. Uh, Representative Walters, we are uh, prepared to work on that. That is something that we uh, recognize um, would would be able to forecast just a little bit that happening. Just to be clear for everyone, um, Wyoming's tomorrow legislation expressly includes Wyoming Works, and that's an important uh, recognition. There, uh, 
Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson, the Wyoming's Tomorrow legislation that was passed in the 22 expressly includes Wyoming Works uh, and to, to ensure there is funding and including the non-credit uh, uh, credential programs that are available. Um, it will take some time. I think we can work through the uh, uh, potential language and draft legislation for that to be worked through. Um, but I think there's a mechanism and a pathway to do that that ensures preservation of those programs under that umbrella. Um, we did test very directly through the generous donation of the Elbogen Foundation, the Elbogen Opportunity Scholarship. And it did include nursing students uh, and it did uh, function well under that umbrella. So we do think there's an avenue on the student grant side. Uh, I, I wanna be clear about that. Wyoming Works is more than the student grants. Um, when funding has two parts, it has the college faculty side and the student grant side. So on the student grant side, under the Wyoming's Tomorrow, um, we think there is a pathway to uh, preserve Wyoming Works, student grants, and, and Wyoming Investment in Nursing student grants. And we're happy to work on that. Anything else on Wyoming's Tomorrow? Representative Stith, thanks for your patience. Mr. Chairman, Director Caldwell, um, I've got a question about compensation for the, at the community colleges. It's struck me as odd that a full-time community college professor in Rock Springs makes less money than a Rock Springs high school teacher. That's just the way it works out. And perhaps you can help me or not. So when I look at the, right now, the state aid per full-time equivalent student for an academic year, year <clears throat> excuse me, is a little under $15,000. So it's 14,834, um, but that's only 55%. The state aid is only 55% of the total budget. So if you gross it up, excuse me, you've got like $27,000 per full-time equivalent student of money to deal with. Whereas uh, school, high schools have about 16,000 per student to deal with. So if I had a business where per customer, one entity made 27,000 per customer and the other made 16,000 per customer, I would expect the employees to get paid more at the community colleges. So What's the explanation? Is do the full-time community college professors are they not really full-time, or is there something structural about how the community colleges are run? <clears throat> Excuse me, are run that explains the difference. I apologize for my voice. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Stith, I'm not sure I heard all of what you said. Um, because uh, between uh, your challenges and getting it out there and my uh, hard of hearing, it's a little bit, I, I'm, I'm going to try this. Um, he you said you're doing a great job. You just need more money. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, uh, <laughs> that is true. The, the community college, the system is structured at, at about a 60-20-20. 60% state aid, 20% local uh, local revenue, and 20 uh, about 20% uh, tuition, and we're not we're not at that the lower uh, level of that for them to carry on a little bit higher. I'm getting notes here from the deputy who can hear better than I can. Uh, yes, and one thing to also mention is that the academic requirements for the community college faculty are are higher. That's part of their accreditation. That's what. Um, uh, Dr. Moritz just uh, wanted to remind me. So your question is, why is it on the funding side of the community colleges, the community college faculty are funded, uh, that are making less? And that has to do with what the total combined uh, funding is. And also there are limited other sources of revenue. Thank you, Representative Larson. Um, there are other sources of, uh, the K-12s also have other sources of revenue to help the community colleges have a more limited scope of revenue. So they really have to make it on uh, those funds that they do receive, including the volatility of the, that happens with the local revenue. And I think you all know that. I think we're up 7% this year, but after being down 14% last year. So we're still not even back to, we're just barely back to 2019 level. Uh, so it has to do with that combination of um, between the erosion, because we don't have an external cost adjustment for inflation, and um, the, the cuts that we've had, the colleges are really having to manage on a very tight budget. Uh, go ahead, Senator Steinmetz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to, did you have a follow-up? 
I'm, I'm going to. I better stop while I'm behind. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to resurrect the question from last year that we had for you. And that was, if you could have a one-to-one -one match um, and funding that way, rather as opposed to Wyoming's Tomorrow, or which would you choose? Would you rather fund Wyoming's Tomorrow or what would you rather see, you know, um, more of a one-to-one -one match or a block grant to community colleges to decide how they would want to spend that money? Mr. Chairman? Please. Uh, Senator Steinmetz, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna say both, um, as you knew I was going to say, uh, but I want to uh, make a distinction here because those are two they they serve two different audiences. Um, the uh, college funding that we are requesting helps operate the actual colleges, and we know that they've had that uh, significant erosion that we've been able to track since 2010. It's been a, a definitely a diminishing resource uh, for them. It's contracted the system. Wyoming's Tomorrow funds students. It, it does not go to the colleges, it goes to the students to pay for their post-secondary education at both the community colleges and the university. Uh, it, does have a, it does have a cap on that that was structured um, very carefully. I, I've got to give some recognition to that. That's part of the reconciliation we'll have to do between Wyoming Works, for example, and Wyoming's Tomorrow. Uh, but they're two different pots of funds. And we have to recognize that the, the student grant funds going to our adult learners helps them attend. They have a lot of barriers. We're talking about adults with a lot of complexity. They live in our communities, they work in our communities, but they do have this uh, financial barrier. So it is to address the student need that's been on the books since about 20, uh, 2010. So again, the short answer is both because they address two separate um, groups. Uh, one is to operate the colleges, and wants to support students and the citizens of our state. Other questions? Any follow up? Mr. Chairman, please go ahead. So, Sandy, um, given that explanation, because the commission has kind of bought in on the Wyoming's tomorrow, could you give me what you think the primary purpose of that is? Is it just to provide an education through the community colleges? Mr. Chairman? Please. Um, Senator Hicks, um, it is about economic vitality of our state, and this is something that we did document through the uh, post-secondary educational attainment work. We modeled that after other states, um, where we know that when you uh, raise that um, the training and the post-secondary credential, whether that be through a certificate, an associate degree, a bachelor's degree, we know that that then has the generation in the state. It is the number one predictor of long-term uh, uh, economic um, uh, prosperity for both an individual and a state. And we've seen that in, for example, the state of Tennessee. So it is really about long-term economic development of the state and economic vitality, particularly when you're talking about the adult learners. 24 uh, targets the 25 and older starts at 24 to get them through their credential program. They're already in our state. They're already working in our state. They already live in our state many of them at a low income level. And we know that this will help provide a trained workforce when you're talking about the certificate and the associate degree level. We also know with the bachelor's degree, it begins to create new business and industry in your state. So Mr. Chairman, just to follow up. So in my mind, uh, doctor, what that did is that described the goal of the program. And to, to be able to quantify your goals, you need to have metrics and how you measure that to come back and make sure that it's meeting your goals and every objectives and stuff. So along those lines, if it's really about economic viability of our communities, what has the community colleges decided associated with? You know, you're already talking about criteria for adopting and the scholarships and how they work. How are you going to have a feedback mechanism to monitor the very thing that you said you want to do is, is it's about economic viability. So as these students come in and go out, how are you going to prove up your objectives and your goals to say we're meeting those? And then based on that data, say, at what point in time do we need to then readjust or reevaluate the deployment of this program? So, so what's the discussions that have occurred on that? And, and what are we looking at? Please. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Hicks, I love that you asked that question uh, because this is something that uh, we've worked in depth on. So I'm going to talk about sort of three components that are going to help uh, guide us in that. So one of those is we we have a very robust statewide college system strategic plan that um, is now one that really works very directly on specific metrics around that. This is embedded in that. We also have the legislative um, post-secondary educational attainment strategic plan that includes these metrics as, as well. Um, I am happy to provide that to you uh, and even go through it with you. But more directly, we're into this next iteration of not how do we get there for the post-secondary because we know that it will have an impact, but how do we actually then activate that and then uh, are able then to see the impact in our long-term economic vitality? And that's part of the work of the Wyoming Innovations Partnership. And I'm very pleased to say that. Um, our new executive director, Lauren uh, Shanefeld, she's gonna be before you next week. This focus on metrics is a part of what she's really diving into right now. And I'm, I'm actually very excited about that. She started not very long ago and has already um, uh, put out the structure for what, for what that data is gonna provide us. We're gonna use the sleds as part of that because that includes the education, it includes the workforce data, and now we're gonna see the family uh, services data come into that. So I'm, I, I would say that we have three different ways to look at, are we going in the right direction? Are we seeing the type of um, uh, credentials that are going to lead into this? Because we want them to match, right? It's part of the governor's um, boots initiative where we can actually see if we're putting out programs and degrees that aren't targeting the areas that we need, it's gonna be a mismatch. And then, so we have the Wyoming Innovations Partnership with that is helping to direct that in the areas that we need. So the metrics uh, I think that we're gonna see on that are gonna be not just here's what we're trying to do, here's the, the type of credentials we need to see, what is the outcome? And that's the desire that we wanna see out of the Wyoming Innovations Partnership metrics. So Mr. Chairman, what I think I heard you say is you're working on. And again, I want to know, get specifically back to your previous statement is, is it, it's the goals is economic viability for the state and our communities. And so I didn't hear any definitive and we don't need to go into, I'd love to see the stuff. I'm not worried about education attainment. I'm right back to your thing. How is this going to, how are you going to measure economic vitality of the community and the state? Because that's translated through the individual, specifically back to this program. And so we don't need to have this discussion now, Mr. Chairman. I would love to entertain it and anything that you have along that. But what I heard you say is you're working on it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chair, came back on me. Um, We're the Fred and Barney of the appropriating process. <laughs> I wouldn't quite say that. Um, I would love to have that conversation with you as Senator Hicks. It, it is more than we're working on it. We're a little bit of uh, uh, flying the plane while we're, while we're building it. We are working on it, but it's not that there isn't information and data there. We're trying to make sure that we're really uh, having the right data for the questions that we need to be asking. And I think that's an important point. So there's sort of two components then. I'm gonna branch off a little bit because there's an, another area I can't, I can't speak to. The economic development strategy of the state is lives in uh, the business council and how that's addressed across the state. We, we are anchored to that economic development strategy plan, uh, the Wyoming Business Council, because it is for the state. Um, WIP isn't the one that creates it. It helps provide the direction to help um, elevate and activate that. And that's where we're working on the metrics. Is it doing what we need it to do as we're identified in the directions we need to go? We're working on it. <laughs> Anything else? We're at 9.30. Anybody else? Please, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you. Um, so, so I have a, a question and, and some comments. And I'm, what I'm, I'm thinking about the teaching profession and, and educating educators. So in, in UW's um, budget, supplemental budget, their Department of Education is asking for roughly a million dollars to, to do, to, to to set up a process where they um, evaluate and recruit and then follow students through through high school or even even before and those who are predisposed or interested in becoming teachers um, so Wyoming residents teaching in Wyoming theoretically 
they want to they want they want to recruit them they want to encourage them and set up a program and then kind of follow them and i'm going well this sounds a lot like or a component of or it could be a component of the statewide longitudinal education program uh, you know a, a a way that we can actually do this tie in with uw tie in with community colleges um, on our on how we go about recruiting and, and gaining more active participants in our education curriculum, both at the community college level and, a, and at, the, at the UW level. And, and I'm just curious if you have any process like that now in place, what, what do community colleges do to recruit at the, at the high school level or to follow uh, or encourage um, that type of structure? And, and should this program that the Dean of the Education be tied into an, a more of an overall plan and, and a systematic approach to getting more teachers um, from Wyoming teaching in Wyoming. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Moritz. This is why I bring them so that if you ask me hard questions, I have the smart people uh, with me to answer that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just hit it at a brief, uh, at a high level. The colleges have active education programs. That, that is one of the um, uh, content areas that the community colleges do have. We also have worked very, because you're talking specifically about the request they have in for the College of Education and uh, Dean Thomas, Scott Thomas, who is their uh, Dean of the College of Education, who is actually very focused on, on education, education programs. And we actually work very closely with him. Um, I'm gonna let Dr. Moritz talk about that just for a moment, including the CTE teacher prep program that is in place right now. Go ahead. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Chairman Nicholas and, and Chairman Kinski. Um, yes, we, we do work closely with UW and um, Dean Thomas uh, on a lot of these education issues. First of all, um, the colleges, as Dr. Caldwell mentioned, um, do a significant amount of recruiting in their service areas and a significant number of UW's education graduates are transfer students from the community colleges who do that two plus two program. So it's, it's a robust program. I don't know the exact percentage of UW education graduates that start at the colleges, but it is significant. Um, I think what uh, Dean Thomas's um, approach is, is uh, a recognition of the fact that with the teacher shortages we're all seeing, um, we, need to, we need to do more. We need to do more recruiting and we need to do more um, uh, graduating of uh, education students so that we have that next generation of teachers. I, I believe his approach, and, and you can ask um, the UW folks when, when they're up later, um, is to approach it from more of a statewide level and to um, use data as much as possible to, to move forward. Um, that's been particularly the case with the CTE teacher ed uh, program. That's been a partnership between the colleges and the university for, for many years and um, is, uh, I know Dean Thomas is very focused on uh, addressing the, the historically small number of graduates that come out of there. And so he's working with us. We're looking at, at ways to utilize data to identify those students and encourage them. Not only uh, those that are immediately transferring or graduating from the community colleges or high school, but uh, I think a, a crucial piece of that also is identifying adults in the field now, whether it's in uh, construction trades or welding or some of those, who may be um, interested in returning to uh, school for a bit so that they can uh, share their knowledge with the next generation and become teachers themselves. So it's really an all, um, all of the above approach, I think, to recruiting. So do you have programs either statewide or within the individual community colleges where you go out to obtain data or to recruit students in high school to become teachers? and encourage them in, the, in that field? Mr. Chairman, um, yes, and the community colleges also have the, um, they do a, a high amount of uh, dual and concurrent enrollment. So they actually have a direct avenue uh, in order to do that. Of course, they, they recruit them in multiple areas. So I always wanna be uh, cognizant of that. One of those areas that has become one that it, they're really trying to reach at a younger audience is the CDE area. And that is one that UW has really committed to relaunching their uh, campaign on uh, reaching out to not only the high school students, but actually those individuals in our communities that have some of those degrees 
They've worked in business and industry and could absolutely be valuable in the classroom. UW has also um, made sure that those students can come back and get that teaching credential. So it's more than just the high schools and the recruitment that is absolutely happening, but also um, to those individuals in our communities and uh, to be able to, do, to, to be able to do that. So it is an, an active effort at the colleges. Anything else? Representative Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a real quick comment. Um, Senator, sorry, Senator. Thank you, sir. Um, just a real quick comment. Um, I'm so happy about the BAS program okay. success. It's I can see it working. Um, and I especially want to give kudos to uh, Dr. Brad uh, Tyndale at CWC, who who's really made this priority. And in my neck of the woods, this is something that the community colleges are doing so so very well at. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else for the Community College Commission? Mr. Chairman? Please. Um, I would like to just wrap it up if I could. I just have one, I have a request Sorry. just in conclusion. Uh, there's, I just want a memo, short. Um, the largest high school in the state of Wyoming is the community college system. I'd like the number of high school dropouts that you that you take on and try to train them up to get them a GED so they can move on to college. That's all unfunded, in my understanding. Um, you get high school graduates that aren't ready for college. You have to have a remediation program so they have basic math and basic English. I'd like to know how many of those are, and I'd like to know what that costs you, unfunded. And then you have programs for, for students that are at risk. You know, uh, Perseverance is a big issue in the community college system, so you have to have coaches and people to help, help get them through. Uh, the perseverance. I'd, I'd like to know what those programs cost. And that, and again, that's all unfunded, but particularly one and two where they've flushed out of the school system and you're, you're trying to get them a GED and, and where they've come out of the school system and they still aren't ready. I'd, I'd like to know what those costs are so and the number Co of students, please. Co Chair, I'm, Co -Chair. I'm curious. I don't, I don't think any of them are unfunded. When you sign up for the community colleges, you have a, a head count. They pay tuition, and then we pay back. We we reimburse for the number of candidates they have in school. So they're not unfunded. They're Mr. 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 Co-chair. That's not what I was told, but maybe I'm, I was pulled wrong. Mr. Chairman, um, we can get that report for you. Um, we do have uh, also our adult education, which includes the, and then we also have the high school equivalency program. And we do that through uh, the community colleges, Department of Corrections, and um, the BOCES. Uh, we'll, we can get you this information. We'll do okay. that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you all very much. We greatly appreciate it. Mr. Um, Chairman? Yeah. Oh, please wrap up. Yes, I'm sorry. I, wrap up? <laughs> I would like to wrap up if I may. Um, I, I just want to wrap this up a little bit. I've got two things that I want to highlight. One is you did, uh, ha um, we reported to the Joint a Appropriations Committee for a very long time. You move that over to uh, through Management Council to the Joint Education Committee. And I would like to give some recognition to the Joint Education Committee. They've taken it on seriously. Uh, and you will see a suite of bills come forward, even one that's a CAPCON bill that we asked them to do. Uh, and one that's to help correct the fact that we have a very challenging dynamic to even make an exception request on fixed cost adjustments. Um, last year in the biennial, Director Hibbert helped us with that, even though the commission couldn't take action. So the Joint Education Committee is bringing that forward. So I wanted to take a moment to recognize the really hard work that they did and learning about the community college uh, operations, the funding and all of that, because it is complex as you all well know. And then the, really the last thing I wanted to mention is on CAPCON and major maintenance. We've spent a lot of time this year working with Director Vincent. I wanted you to know that because you've heard a little bit of that today. We spent a lot of hours as he was getting up to speed. Uh, and we also want to, uh, and I know he probably doesn't love this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Representative Larson um, has really spent a lot of time with us and recognizing that the commission and the um, state uh, construction department were working on some projects. We were having to navigate how to do things like the cap renewal. And um, it's, I really appreciate Representative Larson taking that on and trying to work through how that might might be handled on uh, the legislative side on a statewide basis rather than in the colleges alone. So thank you, Representative uh, Larson for that. And then lastly, 
we just want to thank you, the appropriations. We had a small request this year, but we have had a lot of work that you tasked us with in the past, and we've been moving uh, forward on that. I want to thank the governor's office and a and I, Director uh, Bach, for helping us through our contract extension. And then our new WIP executive director, Lauren, is doing a fabulous job. Uh, so with that, I, if you want to hear from Dr. Devine, he's sitting behind me. Uh, and we also have um, our executive director, Terry Dugas. But with, with that, that's up to you as a, uh, as a committee. Uh, we're 15 minutes behind. We do have to get people on the road. I, I think maybe next time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I hope you all have a wonderful holiday. Thank you. Merry Christmas. So folks, we're 15 minutes behind. We're scheduled for a 15 minute break. Let's truncate that to 10 and be back here at five to 10 for the University of Wyoming.
Almost there, buddy. Do you so, want to? So, Mr. Coach, before we get started, can we get an update on the soccer game from our good, our resident soccer professional, Senator Grew? Please, Senator Grew, update on soccer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a uh, zero-zero. Brazil playing Croatia, and they're just about to go into overtime. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I ask her please it, because I'm not a soccer. Who's even playing? Yeah. Well, see, Croatia and Brazil. Croatia and Brazil. And I was just in Brazil for the last three weeks. And if you were in Brazil the last three weeks, Mr. Vice Chairman, you would know the answer. I guarantee you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I might. Please. Yeah, but the more important game is at news, noon when uh, the greatest player in the world, Mr. Messi, will be displaying his talents. All right. Everything I never knew about soccer or football, as they call it, football. President Seidel, welcome. Thank you. It's good to see you. And what a beautiful day to be inside. <laughs> so see these, usually it's like an interrogation room with the sun pouring through there. And you can thank, <laughs> thank Representative Nicholas for making things so much more comfortable for you in here today. Just you. as a please, hand, if we do open those back up, you know. <laughs> the floor is yours, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I appreciate good humor <laughs> in the JAC, so thank you very much. Um, so i just like to take a moment, first introduce ourselves. I'm, I'm Ed Seidel. I think I've met all of you now, the president of the university, and I have my team with me, and I'll start with Mike Smith, who's uh, sitting somewhere behind me. Mike is the vice president for government affairs and, and community engagement. Um, also, Bill Mai, uh, some of you, well, all of you will know Bill, I'm sure, but is a vice president for operations. Um, at the table here, I also have uh, Kevin Carman, who is our provost, and Alex Keene, who is our chief financial officer. And I know that Holly Kruk is not part of this particular team, but is following us from the, uh, the director of the School of Energy Resources. And Holly has brought a little construction project for you all, <laughs> so you'll, you'll see that in a minute. So first of all, thank you very much for giving us time today to talk about um, our priorities for the 2023 legislative session. And I want to also thank you for all of your past support of the university and uh, the ongoing dialogue of how we can continue to make our university the most effective it can be for the state. Um, we've come a long way in the last two and a half years since I've come here. I arrived uh, during a COVID during uh, budget cuts of significant budget cuts that really were difficult for us, but we, I think we were good citizens in that and we took the opportunity to, to uh, set us up for the future, which I'm very proud of how we've uh, uh, dealt with that. Um, and um, we also had a lot of instability at the university with a series of presidents. I was the sixth president in seven years at the University of Wyoming and that led to a lot of instability. And I'm here to say that we're in a very different position now in virtually every measure. From our perspective, I just have a few things I want to point out to you. We, Our team is, is fully in place now. We have hired six vice presidents and six new deans, and we're not searching for a single one now. We're uh, experienced, we're energetic, we're stable as an institution, and I'm really proud of where we are now. Um, there's a lot of energy on the campus now as a result of things that we've been doing, and I think uh, perhaps with a, a hopeful uh, budget outlook going forward, we're, we're anticipating being able to really move the university and the state forward. Um, we have very good news on enrollment. We have um, hit our, uh, in terms of first year students coming in, we're up 10% this year. We were up also last year. Uh, we have the largest first year Wyoming student class of Wyoming students since uh, more than 20 years. So that's a very good uh, trend, and we hope to continue that trend going forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, we have um, 969 first-time students from Wyoming that have enrolled this year. Uh, so yes. in total, yes. out-of-state first year? It's... Is it's also up, but not not. At this. I only have the numbers here for uh, for Wyoming. Thank you. Okay, I can get those for you, though, of course. So we've also increased our focus as a university on uh, activities that directly impact the state and support its growth. And, and so you you will 
Remember, I was once a vice president for economic development, so I think a lot about these activities. And so from oil and gas to economic development, entrepreneurship, and the partnerships with the community colleges, and I, I, and my good friend Sandy Caldwell is here as well, and I know she just testified before you, but that is something that I'm really very enthusiastic about. So I'll stop there with sort of the cheerleading part of where we're going, but I'm very, very pleased with where we actually are right now. So if it's all right, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to turn to um, page 24 in, in the budget. Do budget book. And so I have my version of it right here in front of me. Um, and before I, I dive into the details of those priorities, I want to just summarize them. We are focused largely on people and programs in the supplemental budget request and things that enhance our fundamental core land grant mission. And um, I would say in, in many ways, this these are not new programs uh, to Quote from the, the Cowboy Code of the West, it's to finish what we started in several areas. And we'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But before I get into the any of these, one the very top priority that we have is about faculties and staff salaries. And that's not in this list. It was originally in our proposal to the governor. Uh, the governor's included our request as part of his enterprise-wide um, recommendations. And we are fully supportive of the governor's request for salaries. Last year, the you helped us with uh, appropriation of funds that is, have helped uh, put a, a sort of a short-term band-aid, well, long-term funding, but a band-aid to the situation that we were in. The Board of Trustees and my office last year added to that, adding $2 million in one-time funding for our staff, because many of our staff are just not paid at the level that they need to, to really make ends meet. And then there's, of course, we all know inflation that's been been uh, really um, difficult for all of us. And so um, our, our uh, prioritization is two thirds of the money we've requested for salary increases go to staff and one third go to faculty. And uh, and I don't think this will be the end of this because inflation is, is really a, a national issue right now. But just wanted to point out that was actually our top priority. If, if I could turn to page 31, um, our, our number one priority is um, on um, the agricultural experiment station um, activities, particularly just to deal with inflationary costs. The, the cost of chemicals is up about 100%, including fertilizer. The cost of fuel is up 50%. So we're asking for $1.6 million to cover inflationary costs just so that our research centers in, in Laramie, Lingle, Powell, and Sheridan in particular are able to really operate at the level that they'd planned. And so that's just the, the state of affairs is, is what it is. And so we wanna make sure that they're able to, to operate. If I could just go to priority number two, uh, 2A, the science initiative. Uh, again, this is back to people and programs. I'm sorry, it's page 32. These are programmatic funds, to not, not the same as the, um, the uh, capital uh, request that we've made. So just the people in programs, there was a, a report from January of 2015, so eight years ago about the science initiative that led to a number of programs that we've started along with the, um, the funding for the building. And many of you had a chance to tour that building. It's, it's a beautiful building just opened up this year, but we need to really focus on the programs. And so within that, we, we do not have the funding that initially we had um, requested to, to carry out programs in that building. And among them are a program that is very exciting called LAMP, Learning Actively Mentoring Program. And it is basically teaching teachers and professors to teach science in a new way and for which we have a new classroom, a physical classroom. Some of you have seen it. And it is a very different teaching method that has substantially better learning outcomes. I'm not talking about 10 or 20%, I'm talking about 50 to 100% better learning outcomes um, that, uh, uh, with some new teaching methodologies. And we're all in to do that, not only at the university, but also in collaboration with the community colleges. So another part of this is for programmatic funding is a thing called the Research Scholars Program to allow uh, to support undergraduate students to be directly involved in the research enterprise. It's a kind of experiential learning that adds to their ability to um, understand research. And it helps, in fact, bring in, create some new scientists that we're, we'd be quite happy to, to, to make happen. Uh, or it, it gives them a, just a sense of what the research enterprise in science is all about. 
Um, another piece of this is called the Science uh, Roadshow, and I'm, I'm very excited about that. We're going across the state talking about science. Uh, Mark Leifert, some of you will know, Professor Leifert is, a, is now a presidential faculty fellow, and I'm working with him directly. I'm going to be going with him to lecture at science fairs and, and high schools myself, and it's something for which we, we don't have the support that we need fully. We'd like to, to be able to do that. Another piece of this is called the um, the Scholars Program for PhD students. This would directly support more graduate students in order to carry out research with our faculty. And our, it's part of our plan to grow our research activities that, that have direct impact on, on economic development. Um, and it will help us bring in new money from the federal government around uh, research from the NSF, the Department of Energy, the National Institutes of Health, and the federal agencies, which themselves are receiving additional funding now. So we want to make sure as part of our plan to bring in new revenues, we're competitive for bringing that money in. So if the National Science Foundation doubles, our funding from NSF should also double, we, but we have to be competitive and, and ready to do that. And having uh, more support for graduate students will help with that. And the last piece of this is uh, what's called the Competitive Research Innovation Program, uh, which would have additional funds for um, seed funding for our faculty to prepare grant proposals to the federal agencies. And so that will help us tremendously. So um, I, then just to, to finish this piece out, this is still priority 2A. Um, this is not the request we've made to fill out the shelled space in the new building. There's a capital construction request to finish that build out of the construction of that a particular space there um, called the scroll, uh, the uh, a, a learning laboratory. And so uh, Bill Mai could talk more about that. So um, that's that's my- Go chair. Please. Chair. Uh, um, sorry to interrupt. Sure. Uh, so when you complete the build out, that you'll have a, 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 then a, a supplemental component to for the programmatic for that component. Is that fair? I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Nichols, I didn't quite when, follow. When, you, when we complete the build out, mm -hmm. there will be another add-on add for the programmatic operations of the science initiative to run the, the, um, the shelf space that's built out. I so, the, well, the shelled space, we would like to complete that as a capital program, but the, the request that, that we have here is to I know. cover, uh, yes. Yeah. Once that shelf space yeah. is built out, yeah. And it's functional and operational. We'll need additional programmatic dollars to to, to run that shelf space once it's completed. I, I just want to make sure that, that there's not the presumption that this 3.6 ends the issue for all of the operational programmatics for the, for all of the science initiative building. That that's probably I, true. I think we need to educate, make sure that we, we say you, know, you come back and ask for it two years from now. We're going to say no. We've already paid for that. So right. I, so I just want to make sure Thank we're all you for noting that. that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so in essence, just to restate it, what this does is it provides the programmatic funding for the currently operational components of the um, kind of the end of it, of the current operational portions of the science initiative building. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, question. Representative Nicholas. Yes. So what my, just, I'm sorry that I wasn't as clear as I should have been. What my request is to complete the programming that was already planned from 2015. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. All right, moving on to what's our priority 2B, which is on page 42. This is the tier one engineering programmatic funds. And again, this is people and programs. For, uh, for engineering broadly at the university. So again, it's a finish what we started. The original task force uh, that completed its work, I think in 2017 uh, for tier one engineering um, uh, led to a, mom, a number of things, including this beautiful new engineering building that opened up a, a few years ago. Um, but the people and programs are really not at the level that are needed. Not only was that initial funding not provided at the level that was anticipated, but there've been budget cuts on top of that, uh, uh, successive budget cuts, including my, my most, my introduction to the university was the most recent round of budget cuts. So I have now 
created a new committee at the university to talk about tier one engineering 2030 to see about the future as we move departments that are very closely associated like physics and chemistry and geosciences into the and mathematics into the uh, college of engineering to talk about the new opportunities uh, and the initial funding that was actually provided have led to a really world-class petroleum engineering uh, department that is among the best anywhere that you'll find the best in the business uh, and it is really significantly working to help uh, support oil and gas uh, in, in the in the state. But other departments are really um, in uh, at sort of the bare edge in in some cases, not having enough faculty to teach courses that are needed or uh, technicians to to uh, staff uh, equipment that we have. And so we really, really need to to fill that in. So our original request, um, if it were to be uh, fully funded now, would be at five and a half million dollars. Uh, this would be an ongoing request that would be invested in the engineering college in order to make it uh, to really fulfill the original vision of tier one engineering. So this, these are not new programs, but just fulfilling the original vision. That would go for hiring faculty, staff, uh, supporting graduate students. And again, this is, and this is a really important point. One of my most important priorities for the university is to diversify our revenue streams to the university. Uh, and this would be a way that if we hire these faculty and graduate students, we will have a stronger research program to take advantage of enhanced funding from NSF, Department of Energy, and so on. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Salazar, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. President, let me understand this more clearly. If the 5.5 isn't given, then under this last line, under the uh, explanation of requests, it says that most likely will be out of reach in the future. So what if it's less than 5.5? Are we still in the ball game or it, 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 does it require the full funding of this for us to be in reach of those federal dollars? Well, I I would advocate for the full funding for, for multiple reasons. Many of our departments are just at the bare edge of, of being able to operate. So this means, for example, I, I just visited with chemical engineering the other day, and, and so we have uh, uh, only seven faculty in that department. And so there are certain courses that can not even be taught, that should be taught. And so that's, but that's uh, emblematic of what we have across. So we want to be able to fully fund those programs so that we're able to be sure that we have strong programs to, for our students, and then to be able to enhance them to become tier one, which is the original plan. Uh, and so that full funding would allow us to be able to, to do that. So follow up, Mr. Chairman. So, and I understand that, mm -hmm. but are you still in reach of those federal funds if you start this, or do you need the full 5.5 to then be able to reach additional federal funds for this? Mr. Chairman, um, uh, Senator Salazar, um, I would say we, of course, are already doing what we can to write grants for NSF, DOE, and so on, mm -hmm. but we just don't have the capacity to really fully take advantage of it. So it's it, it, more faculty and more graduate students will allow us to take much better advantage of that funding. So the full program that we've laid out that was already laid out five years ago was for would have been turned into what a deficiency compared to our current budgets of five and a half million dollars. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, the next uh, priority three is uh, explanation on page 33, um, campus security, campus wide security measures. It is a two and a half million dollar um, request um, of uh, $2 million in one time, which is largely for equipment to secure our buildings. We have over hundred buildings on campus. The modern buildings are, are equipped with modern security um, installations, video cameras, and sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, electronic uh, locks and such things. But we have a lot of historic structures that have uh, collections of, uh, uh, for example, American Heritage Center and other things where we have collections that are needed that need to be protected. So we have a request to fully outfit our building uh, with security. And then that's a one-time request. And then a $500,000 recurring budget for data services, uh, the, the maintenance contracts and so on, and some staff to help maintain that. So go ahead. Chairman Nicholas. Thank you. So my question um, with regards to this request, and, and it's kind of a, a recurring request in some ways, you've got 
You want $2 million one time, 500,000 ongoing. That's right. My question is, what we don't see is what your business model is or what your cost allocation is for it and how much you're going to pay versus, are we going to fund the whole program through our general fund dollars or are we going to share that cost with you, with your other joint, your revenues? And so how do we know, in other words, how do we know what you're doing and how, how do we know how much we're paying for uh, of what you're asking for? I, I just think th those are important questions um, so that it's not, so, so our, and when is it cost sharing? When is it not? Those are just, it, I, I think we need to know those kind of things. So. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Nicholas, um, I, my colleague Bill Mai will give you the answer you need. Thanks. Mr. Mai, can you answer all those questions from Chairman Nicholas <laughs> in two minutes? Mr. Chairman, I will do my very best. Uh, beginning in fiscal year 13, which is when I arrived at UW, we undertook a similar uh, kind of take if you will, uh, to what the state was doing and had been doing at the time when they modernized security in this building and other buildings around this campus. I was surprised at the security systems that we had at UW, lots of keys, lots and lots of keys. Those were issues. We began a, a, a program where we cobbled together as much money as we could. This is the result of some of that cobbling too and some of the uh, projects that have risen to the top. So as we've built new buildings, we have uh, included uh, state-of-the-art security to the best of our abilities. As President Seidel uh, indicated, we have well over 100 buildings. I think it's 140 some buildings actually on campus. Most of those are pretty old buildings. Uh, to this point, out of major maintenance funds, uh, UW department funding, where we tax the departments to do specific uh, security upgrades at their request, uh, Office of Homeland Security uh, funding that our chief of police has uh, uh, adamantly pursued, um, and then some CARES Act funding, minor amounts, uh, and, and a little bit of capital construction funding. We have thus far put about $3.1 million into that sort of security uh, since uh, 13. Bill, I'd like to follow up on that a little bit, and I, I get that we have to bring the existing buildings up to speed on safety. To have this half million dollars going as, as ongoing, why is that not then taken care of through major maintenance instead of an ongoing appropriation? So, Mr. Chairman, this it's a great question, and, and I appreciate that. Um, this is a, a specific amount required for additional uh, software licensing and a little bit of personnel to monitor these. This one, the, the majority of this expenditure is going to occur in a building that houses a, a fair amount of historic um, artifacts and that kind of thing. And that re this really is to plus up what we've already done on that project. Please. Just to make sure, so these, these are, these are, these are software or, or, technology maintenance agreements moving forward then? The, Mr. Chairman, the, the portion, uh, that $500,000 portion is, it's that and personnel, yes. Primarily it's software and, and those kind of agreements. Well, but you, sorry, Mr. Chairman, but then you brought in staff. You stuttered in there staff. And so I'm just, I'm wanting to know what that 500,000 is for. Because uh, yeah. we're seeing security and, and what I'm, for your narration, I'm seeing physical nuts and bolts updating and not seeing personnel. Personnel had come in someplace else, but you now you're telling me. Mr. Chairman, we do have a breakout. Alex can take you through that. But what I will tell you is we <clears throat> we have a, a limited ability through our, our current. The reason why there's a personnel component to this is we are not staffed in such a way that we can monitor these these uh, systems the way they need to be on, monitored. So I'd turn to Alex if that's okay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. Uh, so that Hold that mic a little bit closer, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee. Uh, yes, so this contemplates two positions. Yeah, um, I when, see that. Thank when you. When we evaluated their... Apologize for missing that. Okay, where are we? Back to Mr. President. Thank you. Please proceed. Mr. Chairman, thanks. I'll, I'll finish up our 
priorities here, I, I think, quickly. So the, the, the items I brought up have all been recommended uh, for funding by the governor. Uh, but I, I've had some questions from some committee members, and I, I wanted to just talk about a couple of other priorities that were in our request um, that were not recommended by the governor as uh, previously presented. So the first of those is the so-called Advanced uh, Research Computing Center, the ARC. Um, it is the primary, it's a $5 million one-time request. It's the primary research computing facility at the university. That's on uh, page 33. I'm sorry, yes, uh, on page 33, exactly, and into page 34. It is the, the primary computing facility for research for all colleges across the university, from uh, oil and gas work to agriculture, social sciences, engineering, and so on. The lifetime of a typical uh, High performance computing environment is about four years or five years. Um, parts of this facility are eight to 11 years old. And so some parts are actually failing. And so uh, we need to replace those. We have just hired a new director of that facility from the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, very experienced and national expert. And so we're ready to go on the staffing side and we need an upgrade. A piece of this would be for a new artificial intelligence cluster that would be used for students and faculty, as well as the, the foundations for an industry partners program, which I think we can do. That program can potentially bring in millions of dollars in revenue in partnerships with companies while also advancing companies' interests. And this is something that I feel very strongly about that we can do. I wanna make sure you know, this is not related to the School of Computing and is not related to NCAR directly, but it would provide a stepping stone, a bridge system for us to begin to take more effective use of, of the NCAR facility. Yeah, please. So I'm, I'm curious about this. And so my question is, are there matching dollars out there to help fund this type of a, it seems to me there probably ought to be. Number two, if you're asking for 5 million, the governor denying the request, um, if we funded half of it, would then would would you be able to come up with it if if it's that important to find a way to get this moving, or 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 can you stage it? Is it is it, is, is it just a five million dollar project, or can just help us and kind of swim through the the alternatives or what? what sure, happens? Mr. Chairman and Representative Nicholas, um, there are ways to uh, bring in other funds, and and so in fact, initially there was a request that was a ten million dollar request that went for the Wyoming Innovation Partnership. And so um, that was, uh, we've decided, we, that roughly breaks down to 5 million for the university uh, for core facilities and then 5 million to help serve the entire state. And so we've, uh, that still, there might be a possibility of some funding coming from that. I, I don't know where that stands. That's now being run out of the governor's office. So, so we're having conversations. Uh, so another piece of this is there is National Science Foundation funding uh, and in fact, we have just put in a proposal to the um, uh, the so-called MRI, Major Research Instrumentation Program to NSF. Those are very competitive dollars, and I don't know if we'll win that proposal or not. They're probably about a 20% hit rate in terms of being able to get funded. So we're working on alternate sources of funding. So my question then, if, if you receive a grant or you find some other source, if we put in, okay, we'll give you 2.5 million, um, but you have to find the other money through matching or some other component. At least it's not a no. That, so. that's, that would certainly be helpful. I mean, we, we are really needing this facility, so that would be helpful. All right, I appreciate it. A question for you is, is uh, you're familiar with uh, Professor Peary's desire to get onto NCAR for his research. Would this fulfill that need so that we don't have to negotiate with NCAR? No, it, it would not fully fill that need. Uh, the oil and gas exploration simulations are very demanding. So it, it's helpful. I mean, it's helpful. But uh, 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 Professor Peary would will need tens of millions of CPU hours in order to do the kind of work or potentially even more than that. So, um, the, and the new facility at NCAR, there's a new an NSF facility that will be coming in place in this coming year, um, is, uh, is very much more powerful than anything we'd be able to staff up at our own center. Okay, thank you. Please proceed. Oh, uh, Mr. Representative Larson. And this maybe goes over to the budget. Do we have a feel why this was denied as we contemplate that? What's the rationale for the governor's rejection? <clears throat> We spoke yesterday of the process that the governor put in place for the review of the supplemental budgets. We felt this would be more of a long-term conversation with the legislature 
than this supplemental budget would ask. Anything else? Please proceed, President Seidel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the last item of, of my list here that's related only to the, the people and programs part, but not the capital construction is around um, the priority number five. It's on page 34 to 35. Um, it's the College of Education um, that uh, I know it was referred to in the last um, session. Uh, request is for a million dollars in one-time funding. Uh, it's basically putting us in a better position to train and attract teachers. And this is broken down into two pieces. Um, there's an $800,000 part of this request for both um, marketing and outreach to, to make sure we draw attention across the state and beyond to draw students into teaching professions. And so the uh, new Dean of the College of Education has a pilot program in the last year. Some of you may have even seen some results from that in order to make it more clear to people that there is a great career path for you as a teacher and the state really has a need for these teachers. And the second piece is uh, funding $200,000 for a, a system for tracking um, uh, students in order to help them make the transition um, uh, into the teaching profession, ultimately to the University of Wyoming. Um, and um, uh, our dean is actually on the state's uh, longitudinal educational data system committee these days, and that's a, a new thing as of the summer. I know he's very active there, so I, I think th this is actually a well-intentioned um, pr uh, proposal to help bring in more teachers and, and provide what the state needs. Senator Salazar. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. President, because I, I know that this issue is before the JEC because we obviously are dealing with a problem. So how much is this actually going to recruitment versus tracking the success or failure of Wyoming on, on filling uh, Wyoming teachers? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think the Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Salazar, the um, well, the amounts just, uh, I think I stated that, but it's 800,000 for the marketing and outreach and then 200,000 for the data systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you, please proceed. Well, that that ties up the the requests that we have for, for people and programs, but I know that there is a lot of interest for capital construction. And but before uh, I, you go on to that. Yes, ma'am. You've covered two that were denied, but you, you didn't cover the venture seed funding or did you do that and I missed it? No, I didn't do that one, but I would I would be happy to talk about that. Page 46? Yes. Senator Kinski, I'd be happy to, to take that, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's a request for uh, money for um, venture funding um, for companies. Uh, and um, the idea there is we're making a lot of investments, particularly with the WIP initiative and through the university around entrepreneurship. Uh, we have Impact 307 hubs in Sheridan, Casper, and Laramie. And now with the partnerships with the um, community colleges expanding out, there's now one at Laramie County Community College and uh, other uh, programs at most of the community colleges expanding out. And so the one uh, issue at, at the moment that is really lacking is access to venture capital funding. Uh, and so um, in some, uh, in many places, there are state funds to help seed the development of venture funding for new businesses to help grow uh, the economy. And so we had a request uh, to, to the governor's office of $5 million to help um, begin a, a new seed funding. And so um, we, we understand that there are potentially constitutional issues with having state funding being used directly to help fund new companies. And so uh, there, there may be workarounds to that, but in any case, that was a request that we made. And I, I just, I, perhaps it is really worth, even if there's uh, not a good vehicle for doing this with state funding, it is a need that we really have statewide in order to grow companies out of the entrepreneurship activities we have. So Mr. President, uh, you were kind enough, I, I think a year and a half ago, to, to introduce me to Carnegie Mellon University and, and Pittsburgh Promise, as well as in Chicago, it's That's the- Discovery Partners Institute. Discovery Partners Institute. So it gave me a glimpse into what's possible. So I, I still am trying to understand how this all fits in at the University of Wyoming. Now the SER model I get, so you've got this, this center that, that is dedicated to research and then helping get grants for people that and her, that mission is mm -hmm. fossil fuel mm -hmm. and preserving the tax base of the state of Wyoming, trying to make sure that we can keep moving product. Right. And so 
they'll make a grant to somebody in a, a department. If it looks like it may come to commercialization, then it moves over to SER where they'll surround the, you know, the professor with, with some business acumen to try and bring it to market the most expensive piece. Right. Where is that going to happen here? I see these scattered initiatives. Are, are you going to have something like that for tier one, you know, the, the center for entrepreneurial enterprise, tier one engineering, or, or, or who's going to be in charge of this that would give me the confidence that it's really happening the way SER gives me the confidence that it really is happening? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, there are multiple layers to this. So within the University of Wyoming, we do have uh, entrepreneurship activities and in, in these Impact 307 hubs are physical locations where people are supported to um, typically students and faculty or, or community members to uh, incubate new companies. And so we provide support training. We're building a mentoring program around that as well of alumni and others who can help uh, uh, people learn how to build the business. And so um, then through the WIP initiative, those activities are expanding out to the community colleges. And so we're working hard to build out those same activities across the university and across the community colleges. We have also at the University of Wyoming created a, a new structure that spans the entire university the uh, Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation that is making sure that it's not just a silo here and a silo there, but it's trying to connect the programs, including with tier one engineering, but also it could be in uh, some of the science departments or in social science or to help grow the creative economy where we have, for example, around the Nelchi Center. I know you're familiar with, with Nelchi's program to help grow the creative economy in Sheridan. So there are there is training and there is... Um, the mentoring that's available. But the thing that is lacking in all of these is availability of venture capital funds in order to build, to go beyond the, just the business plan, but then you need capital to get a company going. That's, okay. that's where that would go. So to just skinny that down a little bit, and I'm sorry that I, I'm trying to make sure I'm following. If I'm, if I'm a professor and I think I've got a breakthrough on carbon that I can, you know, we can somehow make the carbon evaporate or right. something. I know to go to SER, they'll help me write grants. And if it looks like you go to commercialization, they'll help me commercialize. And, and, you know, maybe I get a cut of the pie too. If I'm over here and instead I think I've found a better mousetrap, I go to this Center for Entrepreneurial, what did you call it? Entrepreneurship and Innovation. That's right. And they would do the same thing for my, my mousetrap as SER would do for the guy that's invented the secret to carbon capture. That is, that is a part of it, but now SER um, does not specifically specialize in creation of new companies. So they do this, but we, we're trying to enhance this ability across the whole university. So SER is a model. They do very well. We want to make sure we bring help support them and bring that to the, the entire university and then through the WIP initiative to cross the whole state. So we want to have economic development centers in the entire state, not merely in Laramie. And that's what, and then this venture funding would be managed in a way out of our office uh, for the um, uh, Impact 307. We've just hired a new associate vice president last year for economic development, Steve Farkas. Many of you will know Steve. So this would be funding that would be managed um, under the, the under Steve's office in order to support uh, the creation of new companies. Okay. And so I, I I won't belabor it too much more, but I just I want to make sure I understand because I saw it at Carnegie Mellon University. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that again. So I'm trying to, because what I've heard about the University of Wyoming is there's some brilliant young professor who's got a breakthrough and then the, some other university says, we'll pay you more, we'll surround you with lab assistants, we'll give you the facilities and we'll help you commercialize it. The guy's gone. That happens. That's right. Are, are you, <laughs> so are you... So that you've got a competitive response to that. Now. Yes, okay. absolutely. We have not historically done very much in this area and we definitely need to now. And then the venture seat, the, the three things that you had me learn when I went on the road is being able to co-venture with private enterprise. Mm -hmm. And you were working on streamlining that process. Mm -hmm. Right. Surrounding the professor with business expertise. Right. And then, and then talent cycling. And a lot of those were policy changes, but some of them were financial. How are you coming on partnering with private enterprise? I told you about the company that said they worked with one university was simple and with university was more difficult. Right. You're simplifying the IP process. Yes. Okay. Where are we on that? 
I, we're firing on all cylinders. Our new vice president for research and economic development, Parag Chitnis, has just joined in, over the summer. He is an expert in this also. He was the director of uh, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture um, at, uh, at in, under the USDA. As experience, uh, we're staffing up our our office uh, and uh, the, the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. We've just hired in the last year an expert in entrepreneurship who started multiple companies and has a lot of experience with this. I mean, global companies. Okay. And so we're just beginning um, in, in the beginning phase, but making a lot of progress and putting in the infrastructure to grow this enterprise. And the IT policy has been simplified? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your patience. Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you. Um, another question, um, and if you would, maybe some, some background information. So on the BSL lab and the, and the number of pathologists that we have um, you know, in for our vet labs, my understanding is that it's hard to fill the positions that we've just lost uh, the director or one of the directors that in order to get work done, you'd basically need three pathologists, um, that, but they may be underpaid or, or other issues with it. Just help me understand where we are and where we want to be. It, it, um, the BSL labs and the vet labs. Bruce Alosis, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, um, Co-Chair, <laughs> um, uh, I would like to turn to uh, Provost Carmen to answer that question. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Nicholas. Put that uh, mic a little closer. Closer, better. Uh, yes, this is a challenge for us as we, uh, we have, uh, this is a national issue uh, where uh, university facilities, uh, such as the biocontainment lab, uh, are competing with the private sector for these pathologists and they offer much higher salaries. Um, we, it's difficult to get a firm handle on exactly what is required and with whom we are competing, but uh, we know that our salaries uh, are not competitive and that they need, if we're going to have a viable facility that we need to uh, make changes there. Uh, for example, uh, the salaries that we have for our, uh, some of our current faculty are around 117 dollars to $140,000. We think that entry level salaries probably need to be at least in 136 to 140,000, probably senior level folks closer to 180 to 190,000 in order to be able to uh, recruit and retain uh, these folks. We, we are in the process that we have three searches underway. Uh, we're also uh, beginning a process for uh, recruiting a new director for the for the facility. Um, but again, there is a resource challenge there. My estimation is, uh, if I could anticipate uh, perhaps the next question, that what would we need to to make ourselves competitive? Uh, my estimation it would be on the order of two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars would would allow us to um, be able to provide competitive salaries to recruit and retain those pathologists. So flesh this out, explain to the, to the committee what these folks do, who they work for, um, what services they provide, and why they're important to Wyoming. Well, they're a critical resource to the, to the state of Wyoming. Uh, they work on uh, disease that are related to uh, uh, livestock as well as, 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 as wildlife. Uh, brucellosis is, is one that we, uh, we know is, we're keenly aware of. Um, and we're the only facility in the state of Wyoming, so there's no place else to go uh, at, for, uh, for having these analyses conducted. Uh, and uh, of course, these pathologists come with different areas of expertise. I'm not a, I'm not a, that's not my area of expertise, and I wouldn't want to try to venture too far into the specifics there, but you need to have a diversity of expertise within a facility like this in, a, in, able, in order to be able to serve the, uh, the, the needs of the state. Well, and, and we have a lab for it. The we one do that have we a lab. Built and just improve, and basically it's not getting fully used it right now. Is that right? That is correct. That's the BSL-3 laboratory. It's a world-class facility, but it is no doubt being underutilized at this point, and that has a lot to do with uh, shortages in our staffing. So what I'd like you to do is pro provide us a proposal of what you think you need and with an explanation of it. Um, because if, you can't, if we can't fix this now, you're going to be here a year from now doing the same thing, but you're not going to be able to recruit, and we're going to lose traction. We're, we're already losing traction with this facility. And, you know, every um, 
livestock owner in the state of Wyoming, some what fashion or another use has or will use this over time because you can send your samples in there and, and get it, it's a quick turnaround and it's a critical component to part of our agricultural community. So I, I just think it's something that needs to take priority um, and that we would like to know more about. Thank you, Representative Nicholas. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I would be happy to pro provide you with a specific proposal of what we feel is needed to make this. Uh, yes, right. Yeah, I'm talking about in the next two weeks. Happy to do it. All right. Senator, uh, Oops, Senator Salazar was next. Thank you. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you tell me, um, and I understand the pathologist, I, I understand that. How many are we talking about with that salary range? Uh, we we currently have three. We're in a, we're searching for three additional pathologists. Uh, there's also we're also down a toxicologist, and that's a that's a service that we're not providing right now. And then we're searching for a director. Well, Mr. Chairman, please. So what's the in that salary range? What are we looking at as far as total employees dealing in in that range? Uh, I don't know if I have that. So their their salaries currently are in the range of. 117 to 140? No, the one, the, the higher, higher up range, the, the pathology level range. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's okay. what we're paying our pathologists now, which is inadequate, and that's why we're not being able to recruit and repay right. them. But you were talking about an additional... So, so the delta, then, in order to right. get us up to those competitive salaries, yep. I, this is literally scratching me on, uh, scratching this out here on a piece of paper, but I'm guessing on the order of 250 to 300 additional dollars, I... Alex, can you help me with what current budget we have for those positions? It's probably close to 750. I don't know. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, for the positions we have, yes, they are they are currently budgeted around that 113 to 120 thousand dollar range. I think this is a a unique uh, area and challenge where we know that the market far exceeds what we have historically budgeted for these positions. And we need to move money into there uh, without creating compression of those existing employees. That's where we need to be able to move them all up right now for recruitment and retention purposes. And we need dedicated funds specifically for this. Further, Representative Larson. Thank you. Along that line, um, I, th I think it's interesting on the pathologist thing, because currently right now we have no medical pathologists in the state, and which has led to a, a problem and so all of our coroners and, and, and human remains have to go out of state for, for pathologists and we're finally go to Fort Collins and they're being stacked up and you see an effort in our inner committee to try and get some pathologists in, into the state. And so I, I, I think that what we're seeing and I I'd just like your confirmation is in that, in that provision, whether it be animal or human, that pathologist profession is is a challenging recruitment. Is that not accurate? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson, I, I would say that is accurate. Thank you. Then Mr. follow on, please. It's not a follow on. I'd like to go to, but I would like to ask uh, President a question. When you came to Wyoming, you, you really, um, which we appreciated, said we need to diversify in or new and obtain new revenues and diversify our revenues into the, the college. And you've not been here a long time, but I'd just like an update on, uh, are we seeing progress in that? And uh, maybe just give us a 30,000 foot view of, of any progress that you've made there. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson. Yes, uh, we are. So one of the primary avenues for growing revenues um, that we have control of is our research enterprise. And so to that, uh, we internally reworked our business model so that indirect when you get a grant from say nsf a certain amount of that goes to the faculty member to carry out research and some of it is indirect costs and so that helps cover staffing and such things so we we have redirected internally indirect costs back into the office of research and economic development so they can begin to staff up so and they are doing this so that they can better support the preparation of additional grant proposals, for example. So uh, and our new VPR for research, uh, I'm just very proud that we were able to attract him here. He has been at the National Science Foundation as a d division director for molecular biology and also in, within USDA as head of NEFA research programs. 
And so we're just building up the enterprise to be able to do this. So as we have then um, additional grant um, monies that are beginning to come in as a result, it's early goings, but we are building the foundation to grow this. We have a plan that we're developing to go to what's called a, a research, a Carnegie R1, the highest level of research activity uh, that uh, you can be classified at, at a national level. And we're we're within reach of that. And so our, gain, our aim is to grow to that. That includes uh, a, a, a analysis of how much external funding you bring in. We do bring in over $90 million a year in, uh, in external funding, and we'd like to grow that very significantly. So the be beginning steps are in place for growing that, for example. Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, uh, two questions for President Seidel on the venture seed funding. If the legislature were to allocate and grant that request, uh, would that be available then to university professors? Would it be available to residents of Wyoming? Would it be available to anyone in the world? That's the kind of the first question. Yeah, it, it, so it would be um, managed uh, by our uh, Office of Vice President for Research and Economic Development. Um, under the uh, the associate VP for economic development, it would be available um, largely for faculty, staff, uh, and so on from from the university. Um, uh, and then with our Impact three hundred seven hubs through the business research network. And so right now they would be uh, uh, elements that are associated with the university in some way. But that but those are not only in Laramie; those are the other uh, Impact three hundred seven hubs as well. Mr. Chairman, please, please follow up. So. You know, I believe in using government where there's a market failure. Um, is there a market failure in this venture capital space that this addresses? So, for example, the company Plenty was able to get up and running, you know, on its own using private venture capital firms, I would assume. Plenty is a very good example of, of a company that was able to be uh, uh, supported. In fact, it came out of uh, what was now called Impact 307. And so that's a good success story. Um, and so um, they were able to obtain the kind of funding they they needed externally, um, but not everyone does. And so I, I, at the Jackson Tech Summit, there's every year that I've been there for the last three years, there's been a panel on venture capital, and there is a lack of venture capital in the state of Wyoming. So there are firms outside the state that are looking at partnering with us, and so we're beginning to do that. Uh, even uh, from Illinois, there uh, we had some discussions this summer about could they partner with us on venture capital, um, but we don't have anything to to offer ourselves right now. So I was uh, I was approached uh, this year about whether the university would be willing to partner with an external venture firm if we would only put up twenty five million dollars um, in venture capital, we could be a partner and. Um, you know, we don't have that. <laughs> so it takes some money to make some money. That's kind of the story there. And we're talking about a seed fund. President Seidel, I toured what became plenty when I was mayor. That was quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was, it was a UW student who was in your in, in Nate story. Yes. Yeah. And it was, uh, I'm just stunned at what it's become. And it, it's a phenomenal testimony to, to that program at the, at the university, Bill Benson. Who was the director of it then said our, we want to have a portfolio of companies ranging from an idea to i'm at a million i'd like to go to five million and uh i think with 307 we're, we're getting there thank you mr chairman on that on that you may know some maybe not everyone knows plenty is a company that was formed out of the university of wyoming it now has moved uh, has headquarters in san francisco some of us went to visit uh chairman and nicholas uh, was among them um and also uh, los angeles um, Walmart made an investment in them last year of $400 million, and then they've had additional major investments, and we're working really hard to bring them uh, back <laughs> into the state of Wyoming. Well, it's amazing. It started as a <laughs> UW student in the incubator. All right. Thank you. Uh, other questions for the university generally or on the supplementals, please? Specific to the supplemental, I'd like to back up to your request on your priority number four, the Advanced Research Computing Center. Okay. Um, well, it's a question. It's one that was denied by the governor. Um, how much of that system would be utilized to support the uh, goals and objection or goals and objectives of WIP, the Wyoming Innovator Partnership? Would that be a component that would facilitate that to happen? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm Senator Hicks. Yes, that would be that, that facility. Uh, we're already 
beginning to try to make it available, but the, the facility is, is, it doesn't really have the capacity for the whole state right now. We would like to make it available as, as you may know, um, we have a part of the WIP initiative. We had some really good early successes in a software engineering program. Um, and in fact, at Sheridan College, they've just started software engineering associates degree program. Many new students are in, uh, have been brought into that. We'd like to make this facility available for them uh, and for others. And the, the hope is that the other community colleges will also adopt such programs uh, in the next year or two. So we that associated with that, we will need additional computing facilities for people to be able to understand how to use these things. And so that's part of the idea. Thank you. Capcon next week. We will be done with Capcon today at a quarter after and go to SER. Please, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I advise you wrong. You actually have three hours, 45 minutes next Tuesday. Oh, well, let's just finish early today then. No, <laughs> I, at quarter after we're going to be done with Capcom. People can, we, we can drag the chain around the drain for hours on Capcom, but give us an, a, an overview of Capcom with the understanding at quarter after we're going to be done and then you'll be back next week with more detail. Great. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if it's all right, I'd like to um, pass it on to uh, Bill Mai, who is our expert in all things Capcom, and just, if that's all right. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think this is in your capital construction book. Page six provides a kind of a statewide summary of projects, of which UW is explicitly stated in some of it um, and implicitly stated in two at the top, two projects at the top. So with your permission, I would just start at the top and say, uh, with regard to major maintenance. If, if you could do this, just go through this long list and just let me tick off the ones that have a UW element. Sure. You said implicitly in the first two? Yes, sir. So that's state major maintenance. And then the next one is enterprise-wide inflation reserve. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Are those the implicit, where are the explicit? The explicit ones, Mr. Chairman, are down below uh, about a third or a quarter of the way up from the bottom, starting with War Memorial Stadium West Stands Renovation, phase three. And then, okay. and then you go to College of Ag Research and Extension Centers, level three design and construction. Okay. Uh, UW3 Jackson Lake AMK Ranch Renovation Design and Construction. Okay. Science Initiative Shelled Space. And the last one is the roundabout at 22nd and Willet. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Please proceed. Mr. Chairman, out of the major maintenance piece at the very top, UW, of course, is lion's share of that money, uh, just based on what we talked about, number of buildings, number of square footage we have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, across the state. Uh, out of that 17, call it $17.4 million, UW share of that would be about $10 million. And if you recall, in the biennial budget, we were a little over $50 million out of the total on major maintenance. And if you apply that what I'm going to say is probably a minimum of 30% cost inflation that's occurred since 21, since the real impact of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. And, you know, we can go on down the list of political causes. Um, you figure 30% of that 50, we're already 15 million behind on the 50 you already gave us based on that 30. So that's 10 out of the 17. Happy to okay. talk further if you'd like. All right, Mr. Chairman, the $172 million that's shown in the in the inflation reserve account, uh, Director Hibbert and I worked on this number back in May and June. Um, we've been working on it for quite a while. And I think the important thing here, pardon me, with regard to UW is we're absolutely the lion's share of that money. Um, and, and the reason I think for that primarily is um, uh, Mr. Richards actually yesterday requested some information from us regarding status of our projects that are currently in progress. And I don't know if that's been shared with the committee or not, but uh, uh, 
Okay. Well, I'll tell you kind of where we're at. We, we are, our projects are either in uh, being built or they are actually to the final stage of design. So the one that is furthest away, furthest out is actually at 30% complete construction documents. That gives us an advantage in saying we, as, as our cost estimators go through these projects with us as we design them, we're getting constant updates on the economic impacts of, of the inflation. And so again, the natatorium being, being the furthest one out is 30% complete out of those various phases. In construction design. documents. It's in By construction. furthest out, you mean time, it's the furthest away in time. Correct, it'll be okay. complete probably in March or April, we'll have a complete set of construction documents. Okay. The stadium is the next one back and it's at 70% right now. We're very close to being ready to pull the trigger on that on that uh, project. And we have a very good idea of the total cost and the impacts from the inflation that's occurred. I think that um, then law school, it, it actually just began construction or they're beginning mobilization on it to be specific, but we have a contract on it. That one came in at about $8 million over the 30 million uh, anticipated budget. So that's those are the impacts of the 21 and 22 inflation just in that short period of time. Again, it's fully designed. And then our housing projects, uh, we have various components of, of housing to consider. Uh, some of it's complete. Uh, the two big pieces that remain are the two big dorms. The, the North Hall that has the dining hall in it as part of the dorm, and then the South Hall, which is purely uh, residential. Those two have been designed for, uh, I believe we got to complete construction documents in May on those 100% construction documents in May. So again, when Kevin and I uh, began discussing, you know, what, what kind of inflation numbers are we seeing? I think we had a really good idea of, of our inflation at UW. Now, I think we're, we're impacted at UW, um, maybe in Laramie, in ways that some of the state might not be, maybe in Cheyenne or Casper. But my guess is most of the state's going to be close to us or as bad or worse than us. Uh, we're a bit of an island over there uh, as far as attracting qualified contractors and qualified subs and that sort of thing. So these labor shortages, the material uh, shortages, the material cost increases, we're, we're feeling that um, pretty strongly right now. Like I, like I say, we're, I would say we're pretty close to 30% cost increase on, um, on the law school. And I think we kind of got lucky on that one that we were far enough into the design phase of it that we didn't have further construction uh, inflation on it, frankly. Everything else, uh, particularly the, particularly those dorms that are so concrete, steel, and stone intensive, those projects are being very adversely affected by fuel prices. Same things that we just talked about with Ukraine and and you know when diesel is is running fifty percent higher than than unleaded, that factors into it too. So out of that number shown on the second line there, that 172, the lion's share of, of the number that the governor reduced is us. Okay. So let's circle back to that. Let's step, make sure we step through highlighting the rest of the projects. So we'll yep. get hung up on that one. Yep. Mr. Chairman, just wanted to kind of let Thank you, you know. It's, it's much we're appreciated. Hey, okay, West Stands. What do you say? Kevin's got a little bit to add after I finish up our other projects. <laughs> That's okay, Mr. Okay. Chairman. <laughs> West stands. West stands. We requested $11.7 million to plus up that budget from last year. If you recall, when, when you as a body um, appropriated $50 million to UW for the, for the three projects, for law, for pool, and stadium, uh, and said UW can prioritize these funds, but but you called out the projects. 
we had discussion at the time that that UW wouldn't have the resources to fully fund all of that. And that we would, once we had a better idea on funding, we would come back to you. And that's what this is. That begins on page 50 of the, of the explanation. So that 3.3 million is another inflation adjustment, essentially. No, Mr. Chairman, that, that's the governor's change. And I think what the, what the governor settled on, and, and Kevin can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that 15 total shown in column four, the governor's rec of 15 total, was another approach taken by SBC to say, of your projects that you have going, prioritize this 15. That's my understanding of it. Is that correct, Kevin? Okay. Proceed. Okay, Mr. Chairman, the next one is $27.1 million for a series of projects at Laramie, Lingle, Powell, Sheridan, all of those research centers that we have across the state. We asked our College of Ag to put together uh, kind of not a, not a Christmas wish list, but a, what buildings need to be modernized, what buildings need repair. We, uh, a couple of years ago, had a bit of a rude awakening out at the Laramie uh, Research and Extension Center where Ag's kind of notorious for this, I think probably as an industry, but also, also at the University of Wyoming where they wire a lot of stuff together with bailing wire and duct tape and twine and try to make it work. And uh, some of our folks were out there uh, at the Laramie at LREC, we call it, at the Laramie Research and Extension Center and, and discovered all sorts of problems with housing that we were putting our researchers up in and our, our caretakers with the facilities themselves that needed upgrades that somehow no one ever, you know, made a made a point of it or weren't asked the proper questions or something. And we did not know the state as some of these facilities. Now you funded a little bit of this last year in the in the regular session or in the budget session. And where that money is, where we anticipate it going right now, we don't have full design on it yet, but what we the lion's share of that money from last year is going to go to the, the feed mill out at LREC, which was in disrepair from the, I guess, the late 80s or early 90s uh, out at the Hanson Arena. So that that's going to be repaired. And I, I don't want to step too far into Kevin's arena here, but, but we have a new uh, research and extension director across the whole state system. Uh, his name is Eric Webster. He comes to us with a great deal of experience, and, and he's been on this for us to, to try to evaluate all of those centers. That's what this 27.1 million is. Thank you. you got three more projects in 12 minutes. <laughs> I'll do my best, Mr. Chairman. The next one uh, is Jackson Lake AMK Ranch Renovation. And what that is specifically is we're requesting funding, $10 million of state funding, for a dorm uh, um, dining and lab facility, all in one. It's already gone through the environmental assessment process with Park Service, which is no small feat, let me tell you. It's ready to go. If we can get it funded, we can build this thing and bring AMK, which, which UW has, has poured a fair amount of uh, research indirect costs, basically uh, attacks on federal grants that we've assessed over 10 years or so to be able to modernize watered systems up there and to bring uh, the buildings up to a, a point where they're not going to fall apart on us. This would be the final part of that, that research campus up there. Uh, Governor uh, denied the state funding on that. And if you're ready to go, I think I can keep it within the remaining nine okay. or so minutes. Mr. Chairman, you already touched on this, this second to the last one. It's a science initiative shelled space, $12.25 million. That is empty space right now. Uh, I would say the majority of the cost involved in that uh, has to do with a vivarium <laughs> project on the lower floors there. What kind of project? Vivarium, and, and that vivarium houses live animal uh, research subjects. So we have a few small vivarium around campus, and we have one large vivarium 
on the top floor of the biosciences building, not very well known. I mean, not very many people know about it. It's very hard to access for obvious biosafety rules or requirements rather. And the intent, part of the intent of building the science initiative building was to combine all of that, get it into a modern vivarium setting. And that is the majority of that 12-2. There's also a fair amount of, of equipment, research equipment related to microscopy or micro. I don't even know if I can say that no, under no, these circumstances. Micro but that's Capcom and microscopy. <laughs> the 12 minutes Capcom and, and FF and E, <laughs> fixture furniture equipment. Correct, Mr. Chairman. There is some equipment component to that. Okay. okay. And then the last one, Mr. Chairman, is a million dollars for a roundabout at 22nd and Willett Street. And what this is, is an attempt to help with traffic problems in Laramie. Uh, we have a, a 15th Street roundabout designed as part of this housing project. It's 15th and Willett, so it's seven blocks away. 22nd and Willett is kind of the major north-south arterial other than 15th and 9th. Um, I will tell you, 9th, 15th, 22nd, and 30th are the major thoroughfares running north and south through Laramie. Every one of those is a mess at, at critical times, at noon, at 8 o'clock in the morning, at 5 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> We're recognizing our responsibility in this uh, to the city and trying to provide some alternatives here right now it it uh, is uh, regulated with a four-way stop system and I would say that four-way stop system largely is probably uh, uh, better than a light system because the light system that is at 30th and Willett is a wreck I mean it you'll have traffic backed up from Willett clear out to Reynolds in the morning. I mean, like it will take you 30 minutes to go down 30th street. We're, we worked with our traffic engineers and with some consulting traffic engineers. We own all four corners of that, of that intersection at 22nd and Willett. So we're the ones that own all the ground around it. The city owns the, the street itself. We've worked with them to try to get cooperation on whether that's the right solution. They're willing, that's what this request is. Thank you. Before I open it up to Capcom questions, how much time are you going to need to, to close? 30 seconds. Okay. Questions on Capcom? Is the city Mr. Chairman, the, my understanding is so far, the only cooperation that we have gotten from the city with regard to a cost share is they have some utilities that underlie that intersection that are in dire need of upgrade and they'll take care of that part of it but we haven't we haven't attempted to uh cross that bridge can you just wait till they fail and then the city has to dig it up <laughs> we could help them fail yeah <laughs> mr co-chair what else that's all right okay any other capcom questions oh please senator salazar thank you so the governor's change is 169 million. Um, if that were to occur, what what are the ramifications to you, Mr. Chairman? The biggest one is is in that construction inflation piece. That 122 million dollars is the one that's critical to us. Uh, I, I would say at this point, that will help us complete the projects that we currently have ready to go. We have them either under construction or we have them just about fully designed. Uh, Senator Guru. Okay, Bill, can you name those projects? Can you say complete the ones that name those, the ones that you're talking about? You yes, talked about the Mr. Norms. Chairman, the, those are the Stadium West Stands, the Natatorium, and the the uh, South Hall of the, the housing project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Larson. I, I think you have some policy issues at the university that kind of drive that as well, that do, don't allow you to do just real quickly share with us why that's important to have that funding in place. You bet, Mr. Chairman. Which, uh, which I'm sorry, which funding? 
any the, the need for additional this overall funding for the projects that we just okay made. all right Thanks. so mr chairman what what uh, representative larson is referring to is kind of a long history that he and i and others on this committee have regarding uw construction and when I first went to UW, I inherited a few large projects that that were well out of budget, but not very many people knew about it because the trustees uh, processes at that time weren't very clean with regard, I'll say not very tight with regard to how you control costs on projects. Uh, uh, that was a big learning experience for a lot of us. It was a learning experience for the trustees too, and they worked very diligently to clean up those processes. And so what Representative Larson is referring to is the, the regulation that UW has right now that we do not begin construction projects unless we have full funding in place. Okay, thank you. Anything else on Capcom? Anything else? Mr. President, it's to you to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, and to the entire committee. I, I just want to thank you for the time today. I, I want to maybe summarize by saying I believe that the requests we've made here are really needed. They're focused on completing things that we have been working on. They're not new programs, and they're really focused on delivering on our land-grant mission to the state, and I I'm very, uh, I think our entire team is really behind everything we've talked about today. So I like to wish you a good holiday and good deliberations as you decide how you're going to proceed. So thank you very much. Much thanks for being here. We really. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we'll certainly discuss this at length in the uh, Capcom conversation, but the University of Wyoming projects are also included in the escalation, de escalation recommendation from the governor. You know, in vaudeville, they always said, leave them on a high note. Yeah. <laughs> I think the president did that. Thank you. Holly, you're up. Or are we not ready for it? It's the answer is in their priority list. They want to get the new construction done. Or in all just bigger bucket. The answer is yes. We'll see if we can. Show them the direction of existing bucket. I mean, it's education. I've got a couple ideas. I'll start this one. Go ahead. When you're ready. Holly Krutka, SCR. Hey, welcome. And I want to thank you again for the time that you gave me. Many of these folks have already had a tour of SCR and what you do in the mission, as well as the introduction of Muhammad Piri at the Center for Flow, Center for Research for Flow Through Porous Media. And uh, it's all very exciting. You're doing some great stuff over there and, and uh, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, members of the committee. Open invitation to anybody to come visit us at the School of Energy Resources um, anytime. We love to talk about our mission and show off all the great work happening at the University of Wyoming. So my name is Holly Krecka. I'm the Executive Director of the School of Energy Resources. And with me today is Scott Quillenin, Senior Director of Research, and uh, Trina Pfeiffer, who's moving into the position of Director for the Center for Carbon Capture and Conversion. So we really like those long acronyms. So. Um, at, at SCR, our mission is energy-driven economic development for the state of Wyoming. In other words, we undertake academics, research, and outreach in Wyoming for Wyoming. And SCR, our goal isn't just research for the sake of research, but really to engage in work that will ultimately be commercialized here and benefit Wyoming's energy sector. We're look, working closely with many companies that produce energy in Wyoming, and across the state and their success is our success. In the last three months, SER has collaborated with commercial partners and collaborators across UW and across the state to submit about $90 million in energy focused proposals to drive new energy investment in Wyoming. That's something we've never done before. 
in that amount of time. The energy sector in Wyoming is strong today, and our supplemental requests and proposals aim to reinvest back into Wyoming's energy sector. Um, on page 38, SER's priority number one is for 12.25 million for carbon engineering research and demonstration. Since 2016, SCR has led the state-sponsored carbon engineering program focused on identifying new markets and uses for Wyoming coal, a truly prolific natural resource. The team at the University of Wyoming is focused on a wide array of high-volume high products, everything from construction materials like these bricks I brought with me today. And by the way, last time I was here, there was a request to get some for members of the committee. Please do not make me carry those back to my car. Um, we also are working on things like soil amendments to help um, retain moisture and fertilizer in soils and asphalt replacements. Those are our large scale products that we're targeting now. And this is only one, this carbon engineering effort is only one of many areas focused on supporting the Wyoming coal sector. The multidisciplinary carbon engineering program it includes extensive collaboration with the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences and the College of Ag, Life Sciences, and Natural Resources and their faculty. We're focused on moving that technology out of the lab and into the field. And our goal with our current step is to demonstrate this technology to produce the feedstocks to make those materials and produce the, and produce the products at larger scale so that we have the data needed to commercialize the technology. There's two main parts of that technology, pyrolysis and solvent extraction. The funding in our priority number one provides support for the next phase of work, which is to operate the pyrolysis unit field demonstration, which we already have broken ground on the site preparation work. Now, when that unit begins operating, we'll have more of the feedstocks than we've ever had before. So we can test the products at larger scale than we've ever been able to do before and collect data needed for commercialization. With that funding, we'll also be able to undertake the second part of the process, detailed engineering around solvent extraction. And then we'll be able to continue testing products um, made from like the coal-based asphalt made from the solvent extraction. The nine faculty that we're working with on this program at the University of Wyoming are leading 34 undergraduate and graduate students to focus on, this, on finding new uses for Wyoming coal. 11 of those students are from Wyoming. We're not only trying to build a new industry, but make it one where our UW grads can be the first to operate that industry and get gainful employment here in the state focused on our energy sector. So moving to page 39, SCR's second request, priority number two, is 2.5 million for a UW Maori research program. The Maori formation in the Powder River Basin is one of Wyoming's largest, mostly undeveloped, unconventional oil plays. The USGS estimates up to 300 million barrels of undiscovered oil and 330 billion cubic feet of gas re reservoirs lie in the Maori Shale and the Powder River Basin alone. The scale of the opportunity for Wyoming speaks for itself. But the Maori Shale is complex. Yeah. 330 billion cubic feet. The geomechanics and geochemistry of the Maori Shale are complicated and are poorly understood. Often and historically, this kind of work would be funded by the Department of Energy, but the federal government is not funding oil and gas research. And companies that might do this type of research are also being pressured, at least publicly traded companies are receiving ESG pressure not to do long-term oil and gas research. It's a challenge for the oil and gas sector, but it's an opportunity for Wyoming. So if we can make this investment, our goal would be to develop and collect information and learnings that could be given to oil and gas operators interested in the Maori Shale, especially in the Powder River Basin. Our goal is to make investment in Wyoming more attractive than somewhere else. So rather than developing one specific technology, what we're trying to do here is get lots of faculty at the university with different expertise to focus on one formation and unlocking it. 
phase one of the Maori is we've started funding seed projects of this. So it was funded by the Wyoming Energy Authority, and we've kicked that off. It's just been kicked off. And right now there are 11 faculty funded in five departments and the School of Energy Resources working together to just get this program off the ground. If, if you choose to fund this, if the legislature funds this program and we move forward, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, but we have partners across the state. We'll continue to work with the Wyoming Energy Authority, the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute, and the Wyoming State Geological Survey will be advisors in this program, or are advisors in this program, and will continue to be. Please. So I'm curious, Holly, I mean, obviously when private industry does this type of research, it's proprietary information. And so how do we have an idea of what, what so it's, it, you know, it's tough to have to go in and reinvent the wheel for what's already been done in those, in those, from those private industries. Have, have you had communications with who those entities are who have probably already done some of this that have proprietary information that would either want to share it for economic reasons or for ad, you know, to advantage them in their positions as well, either for the leaseholds or for some other components, so that basically we're not all, we we take advantage of that situation. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, we uh, I'm going to hand that question over to Scott, who has there have been successful wells in the Maori. And um, so Scott has been reaching out to those companies already. So. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, uh, you're absolutely right. The oil and gas industry is always very secretive. It's always very competitive. And, and the, the data that they have and house, um, it, they keep close to their chest. Phase one of this program has been focused on opening the dialogue with the various companies that have interests in the Powder River Basin and having just some, some brainstorming sessions where they helped us identify where some broad um, work by the university would really help support uh, the industry as a whole as it, as it goes to unlock this shale. And uh, among those are things like understanding the geomechanics, understanding the broad geochemistry or the basin scale modeling, um, stress regimes across the entire basin. So we've, we've had those initial conversations and, and we feel pretty comfortable that we're honing in on what those research, research gaps lie and so that we can be very effective and efficient with, with our work. Anything else, Mr. Co-Chair? Well, I'm just curious if, um, if somehow, um, we, we maximize that so that, you know, you can work with individuals and sign MOUs where they want to, they can come in and do additional work um, and, and you, you, us be a part of it, but, and, and, you know, you basically you create Chinese walls of, comp of, so that you can work with them and it's not disclosable. Um, so it, it's just a mutual benefit to, to everybody, but it's, it's, it's kind of a new ground to plow basically. It, but you, you you really need a cooperative um, private entity, and and my my guess is that the executive branch, and particularly the governor, could have a lot of influence on getting those major players um, to the table to get something done. Is it a question for Holly? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you think? Um, so, Mr. Chair, Mr. Cook Chair, I think that that's a great point. To date, really, we've been asking them what they need. We haven't gone and said, you know, what we need yet because it's so early in the program. So I think there's plenty of time to still develop that kind of relationship. Senator Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I don't have a background in oil and gas. So help. this is your shot at my vote. Okay. On Maori, what's the difference between this being just a think tank versus you know, a tangible economic, uh, you know, advantage for our private sector that we're going to see dollars for the state of Wyoming. Yes, Mr. Chair, Senator Salazar. So <clears throat> that's a great question. Number one, we're we're not focused on developing something theoretical. We're not really developing new technologies. 
what we're doing is taking expertise that exists and applying it to a specific reservoir. So this is very applied research using um, our skill sets that we have at the University of Wyoming. So that's one. Um, I mean, I think the fact that we're engaging with industry and asking them what they need to help make that investment in the Maori more attractive, it, it shows how this program is being designed. Um, do you have anything you want to add, Mr. Chair, if I could? Please. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Senator Salazar, uh, thanks for the opportunity to win your vote. <laughs> so uh, the Maori shale, it, in, in 2017, industry called it a fail, failed shale. Um, they kind of walked away from it. In 2019, they came back and drilled a few record wells. We still only have about 50 wells that have been drilled. It's an enormous basin. And there's a lot of opportunity there. The Maori also underlies the Wind River Basin, the Green River Basin, and the Bighorn Basin. So this is a, an attempt to really understand a complex geologic system. And we have the laboratories and the bright minds at UW to do it. And we can apply that to the Powder River Basin and if successful, bring it out into these other basins around the state. There could be a tremendous upside for Wyoming. So, so that's really our motivation, number one. Number two, without Department of Energy funding oil and gas research, we are at the, we could, how do I say this? W without those federal dollars coming in to support our researchers, they're going to go off and look at other sectors. This is a way for us to keep our expertise and that we've um, around oil and gas that we're so proud of focused on Wyoming. Anything, follow on? Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Bad fingers. So it seems to me that then this is kind of a, a lesson learned from past experiences historically because it seems that's very similar to what we learned in, in the Jonah field. There was a decade of more late 70s up through the 80s and almost into the 90s where, where gas production, they knew it was there in, in, in those formations in the Jonah, just high pressure, low volume, couldn't get it to do anything. Technology it laid silent for a period of time. Technology changed in fracking. Then we had the Jonah and the, the anticline. Had we been able to approach that resource in a similar, what you're trying to do is not wait two decades to learn how to produce the resources that are there. Am I kind of getting that that right? May I? So, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, absolutely. The rediscovery of Jonah. Um, was really big for the state of Wyoming. So Representative Larson, that, that was your shot at Senator Salazar's vote, right? <laughs> but other, other questions about the uh, supplemental requests? Other questions? Questions about SCR generally? Oh, please, Representative Kinner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so along, along those lines of the Maori, could could you um, perhaps relate it to the the work going on in the Powder River Basin now? Is this would this be comparable to the to the work going on now, or, or potentially? I'm trying to like 330 billion cubic feet of natural gas. That I I can't get my head around that, but I'm trying to relate it to all the drilling that we know is going on in the Powder River Basin now. Could this be comparable to that or larger or some kind of a relationship there, if you could? Thank you. Yeah. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Kinner, uh, you could relate it to what's going on in the Niobrara today. So the continental, or the, what were the Chesapeake resources now, continental, southern powder, um, the Maori would be, if unlocked, would be very comparable to what we're seeing in the Niobrara today. Okay. And, and that's just one basin. Thank you, yeah. Chairman Nicholas had a question, then we'll go to Representative Stitt. When depth and then what's your, your 
What's your, your, your ground cover? Yeah. What, what's the depth of Niobrara and what's the depth of the Maori? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, the Niobrara is a little bit shallower than the, the Maori. They're both Cretaceous in age, but the Maori is a little bit deeper. The, the Maori is the source rock. So we're talking about a shale. It's the source rock for the muddy formation across the Powder River Basin. And the muddy has been the, one of the most prolific uh, oil and gas reservoirs across, across Wyoming. That's what I was going to say. And the, and the current drilling that's going on that he's talking about that is actually not that much, but there's also been some unsuccessful. Bob, you got to get close to the mic. We're getting. There are, how many wills have, have been successful? I, mean, I know I'm, we're familiar with a, a couple of hits that they've had, but there's also been some unsuccessful projects that make it obviously not as easy as, as the Niobrara. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, uh, I believe there's 59 horizontal Maori well, wells operating today. There's 140 uh, permits pending. Not every well has been successful. Over the last year, we've seen four or five that have been record wells. So that tells me that there's potential there, but there's some uncertainty that we need to figure out. Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, uh, Holly, is the report on the... Uh, carbon dioxide to concrete and carbon storage hub. Is that available somewhere? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith. Yes, sir, it is. It has been submitted to LSO, but as far as publicly available, we'll be getting that. Uh, if it's not on our website, it will be shortly. So we're gonna publish it. Okay, further questions? It, correct me if I'm wrong, does the Maori extend under Sheridan County? Mr. Chairman, yes, it does. Yeah, there was a well out east of town on Highway 14. They went down two miles and out two miles. We've always been curious what they found. Interesting. Well, Mr. Chairman, those data should be showing up on the Oil and Gas Commission website soon. All right. Well, thank you. Anything else for SER? All right. Well, thank you for the oh, great... Oh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I still have one, um, one more. Oh, there's another one? Oh, I thought... <laughs> I thought you had two. Nope. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you had three. Yes, because... Um, what page? The third one is on page 46, so it was lumped in a little bit My differently. Apologies. <laughs> so our final priority, number three, is um, $1.5 million for endowment and gift matching funds. So several energy companies working in Wyoming have inquired as to the availability of matching funds if they were to support SCR, not for any specific research projects, but... Um, for general financial uh, support that would help us accelerate our academic outreach and research programs into the future. Um, accessing that pool of funds would require um, a minimum of one-to-one -one matching from a non-state entity and could be used for endowment research, excellence, scholarships, and more. And this pool would revert at the end of the biennium. So um, the only, all I have is closing after that. Anything else on that supplemental request? Anyone? Once, twice, three times, back to you. Yes, and, and I would say I um, will never be coming back to this committee again without a geologist with me. It's the last time, the last time was the last time. So um, really appreciate your detailed questions. And if we didn't answer them, you know, we're here. Um, School of Energy Resources is really grateful to serve the state and grateful for our collaboration across the university, particularly the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences, where we get a lot of the help with these research projects. So I just want to make sure that you all are aware that, 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 that we're working closely with those departments and really appreciate it. That's it. Thank you. Thanks for the great work that you do. And again, I'd urge anybody that's not been over to SCR or the Center for research of flow through porous media to, to do so. It's, it's a real eye-opening experience. Incredible, the work that's going on at the university today. Thank you very much. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule, I guess. Uh, what would we like to do, break for lunch early and then staff can let these other folks know to move it up? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we don't have any agencies um, that, that are prepared to immediately respond, but we could get them here at, at 1230. Okay, so if we just start at 1230. Let's do that. Okay. 1230, and, and I'd, I'd ask two things. Be back at 1230 or earlier, and don't have a big lunch. We don't want anybody falling asleep. It's going to be an exciting afternoon. Big ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
our setup works. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>